Blog Talk Radio. You're tuned in to N5D Radio, the next dimension in radio, where we bring you the hottest, in-depth, spiritual, metaphysical, esoteric conversations and news. Get ready for spirit, body, and mind to expand in three, two, one, 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 one. Namaste and welcome to N5D Radio, coming to you from the 99% Quartz Crystal Sands of Sarasota, Florida, every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, and 12 a.m. midnight in the U.K. I'm your host, Greg Prescott from N5D.com, and for the next two hours, we're going to be raising the vibration of the planet, galaxy, and universe. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the seven ways our children are being brainwashed and what we can do about it, but first... I'd like to bring on my co-host coming to you from San Diego, California, psychic medium, Sherry Elise. Hi, Sherry. How are you tonight? I'm Sherry. Good, Greg. How about yourself? (laughs) Well, this is like a deja vu show for us. Now, to the people listening, Sherry and I did a test show before uh, before she officially came on the air with N5D Radio, and this was our topic. We were basically testing the levels and I was showing Sherry the ropes on how to co-host in 5D radio. So it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Groundhog Day. <laughs> well, hopefully um, I don't stop in the middle and go, what do I say? What do I say? What's my Don't forget your money because it's Have you seen that? That was from Groundhog Day. Oh, 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 that's what it was. <laughs> Uh, namaste and welcome to N5D Radio, coming to you from the 99% Quartz Crystal Sands of Deja Vu, Florida. <laughs> oh, and hello, Greg, and how are you today? <laughs> so, on tonight's show, we're going to be focusing on the seven ways that our children are being brainwashed, which includes religion, role models, materialism, divide and conquer techniques, TV, education, and health care. So, what do you say, Sherry? You want to jump right into it? Oh gosh, you know they're they're all such they're all such tough topics here. You know, mm-hmm. there's all so many issues, and so many of them we can uh, we can start off with um, religion if you'd like. Good idea. <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to remind everyone that our phone lines are open, so feel free to call us at six four six seven one six eight eight nine zero. Okay, so number one, religion. This is probably where the initial brainwashing begins outside of telling our kids about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, both of which have pagan origins. Before Christianity, Christmas was called Saturnalia, which was basically a week-long event full of lawlessness from December 17th through December 25th that honored Saturn. Theology is known as Satan. And Saturnalia included human sacrifice, intoxication, naked caroling, and rape. During these seven days, there were no punishments for breaking any laws according to Roman law. Now, in the year 4 AD, shortly after the meeting of religious leaders at the Council of Nicaea, Christianity adopted Saturnalia with the hopes that they could convert the pagans into Christianity by promising that they could still celebrate Saturnalia as Christmas. Because Saturnalia did not follow Christian principles, the Christian leaders designated the last day of Saturnalia as the birthday of Jesus. Have you ever wondered why Easter eggs and the Easter bunny are associated with Easter? Do you know that, Sherry? I, you know, I'm still stuck on the naked caroling part of that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> You sort of caught my attention. I was having this visual of people going house to house singing, um, you know, singing, singing Saturnia songs, you know, naked. It could so, be a good um, thing or a really <laughs> bad thing. I don't know. I think it would be an interesting thing. Quite frankly, I would probably be there to watch and enjoy. I don't know. Um, I, you know, I don't know about the Easter eggs. I really don't. Why don't you go ahead and say why? Let's bring it on. <laughs> Well, Easter is the celebration of Christ's resurrection, supposedly from the dead, following his death on Good Friday, commemorated around the vernal equinox, 
which is historically a time of pagan celebration that coincides with the arrival of spring and symbolizes the arrival of light and the awakening of life around us. Easter is named after a goddess who was known by the names Ostre, that's spelled O-E-S-T-R-E, or Eastre, E-A-S-T-R-E. And in Germany, by the name of Ostera, she is a goddess of the dawn and the spring. And her name means dawn, the shining light arising from the east. Being the goddess of fertility, her sacred animal was the rabbit. So now you know the origins of Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, the, and Easter eggs with the eggs representing fertility, not the Easter Bunny. Uh, that's actually really interesting, and I'm sure a lot of people didn't know that. I knew somewhat of the, you know, the Saturnia, but I, I certainly didn't. I, I knew part of the Astar, but I didn't know the egg part. Mm-hmm. And now I do. So now when anyone asks me, I'm going to further have this trivia to be able to tell people. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, before anyone thinks this is religion bashing, it isn't, but religion is arguably one of the biggest forms of brainwashing on the planet. I mean, how is it possible for one religion to be correct while others are wrong? You know, does, does it really make sense that if you're, you're not Christian, you'll go to hell because you don't believe in a man that existed 2,000 years ago? Well, you know, I mean, I... I, I think that's the whole nature of it is that, you know, everyone thinks theirs is the right one, of course, um, and, you know, which which has been probably the bane of existence ever since, you know, all of this started. But um, I, I don't know if that's really going to change. I, I was reading something today for Benjamin Fulford, who was mentioning that the Pope was trying to create uh, just one of uh, one religion for the world at this point. You know, this is all conspiracy type of talk. And that some of them were into it, except uh, one sect of the Christians were saying no. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens with that. You know, that's one of those, you know, this is what's happening behind the scenes of the, you know, the great Wizard of Oz stuff. But I guess we'll see. So, Sherry, let's, let's talk about your thoughts on religion. Well, <laughs> you know, um, my I had a very unusual type of religious upbringing in that um, I um, my parents were of two different religions and they were very opposing religions. And um, one of my parents converted to um, the others, and we were of that religion, and um, which I, I didn't really follow. I still wasn't a very religious person. It, did, it still didn't make sense to me. But they sent me to Episcopal school for junior high, and it definitely wasn't my religion for sure. And so I got to be the one person that sat in the back of the church during chapel and mass and uh, didn't get to go up for communion because it was against my religion to go up for communion. Yay! And, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, you know what? Congratulations. I <laughs> no, I was really upset because I really wanted some of that wine and the wafer, oh, you know, yeah. that everyone else was wine. getting. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, come on, you're a kid. You're like, ooh, ooh, ooh get to swig some wine during the day. So it was kind of awesome. I wonder if they but, play um, wine pong during communion now. I don't, I don't know. Well, you know, everybody else got to do it, and I got to sit back there in the pew, and I looked like some oh. heathen, and everybody gave me dirty looks. like Beer pressure. <clears throat> It was awful, yeah. and then on my graduation, the you know the priest demanded that I um, bow in front of the cross on my way up to get my diploma, and I said I'm not allowed to do that, and he was like, if you don't do this, I'm going to beat you, and I was just like, oh my god, because when you're just like 11, 12 years old, you know, you really think somebody is going to beat you. <laughs> So um, I still didn't do it, and and I just I think that I'm happy for this experience because it really really taught me the value of being tolerant towards other people's views, not trying to convert them, accepting you know let, allowing people to believe what they want to believe, and not bullying them and being respectful because people definitely were not respectful to me at all. Mm-hmm. They weren't like. Okay, you go to school, enjoy the school, learn. You're here to learn. It was more like, 
you know, there she is, the effing whatever, you know, and, uh, and it was really rough. It was rough, except that I was such a good student. And, you know, when I was excelled in all the sports that there, you know, there was nothing they could really say except for that, Mm -hmm. but it, it was tough and it definitely gives you some thick skin going into life. So that is my, that was my religious experience. And that is probably one reason why at this point I'm not religious at all is because it, there was just so the, some of the things that I saw were just very negative. Mm-hmm. Now you and brought up a great point too, that, you know, you really shouldn't judge if people are religious or not, because they truly are following their own true divine path of where they need to go. But, you know, conversely, you also have to say, you know, if this wasn't forced upon us as children, what kind of views would we have on spirituality right now? I mean, I, I, I really agree. I mean, I, I think that's one of the ways that you find yourself and you find your own spirituality, you know, by exploring. Because I, I have to say that I, I find some beautiful, beautiful, beautiful things in the Quran, mm-hmm. some beautiful things in, you know, Buddhism. And, uh, you know, virtually all religions, I find some very, very beautiful things and things that have, you know, that I've incorporated as far as my spirituality you know, take some of these elements, and, and, I'm, um, and I'm totally okay with that. Now, if there was something, a religion that ultimately you had to choose, which one would you choose? Um, you know what? I'd pro- <laughs> God, I'm scared to say this. I'd probably be a druid, quite frankly. Really? I, yeah, you know, I just, I'm a little bit of a, I'm a little bit of a, a fairy folk, and, uh, you know, if, if I had any place to live, I'd probably live in a tree house and, you know, and be at one with the fairies and the leprechauns and the unicorns, so <laughs> mm-hmm. I'd probably be okay living in a forest, and I'm just, I'm very attracted to that, and so I thought that's, I probably was at some point of my life, and I still carry a lot of that type of um i carry some of those cell memories you know you could start your own fairy religion with our former co-host kendra gilbert oh was she really also (laughs) she loves the fairies she's (laughs) she's in chat right now under the daily spiral that is her chat name right now well you know who doesn't love fairies they're so (laughs) cute and sparkly (laughs) everyone Uh knows that from looking at my website oh yeah it's like, you know, a, a plane of fairies and butterflies. I think probably most men would go there and be like, oh, you know, so I'm trying to cut out some of the fairies and butterflies so it would be a little bit more male friendly. <laughs> a little off topic. I, I just got visited again by a, a, a butterfly. These monarchs, they keep flying into my lanai, and uh, this time – my German Shepherd puppy kind of notified me that this butterfly had fallen into the water. So I got him out of the water and let him dry off on my hand. And I took some pictures of it and posted one of them on the Facebook, on my Facebook wall. And I let him dry off and then he flew away. But uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing sign, butterflies, of uh, rebirth and uh, spiritual growth. So if these uh, butterflies come into your life or really any other animal <laughs> like woodchucks, uh, <laughs> that's kind of an inside joke, folks. There's a, a video on YouTube. It's called WTF. There's a woodchuck in my bedroom. And uh, I was up in New York when uh, uh, living in, in this uh, house in the country, and my bedroom was on the second floor. And I, I, I took a nap one day, and I heard this rustling in my room, and there was a woodchuck in there scruffling around so anyway check it out it's on uh, youtube wtf there's a woodchuck in my bedroom i'm not going to give the surprise ending but it's it's pretty funny oh i i absolutely adored it i saw it so many times because this was gosh i think this was right around the time that we first met and i was looking through some of your videos and i i thought it was hilarious and you know my favorite part is the ending because you can't well, say it <laughs> Well, also, one of my favorite parts is the part I got to tease you about your room being a little bit messy. A little messy. But a little bit, but that's okay. That's okay because, you know, uh, you you doing your thing in there. You were doing your thing in there, but it, it was a wonder why more little animals <laughs> didn't decide to make their homes in there, you know? I just find it fascinating that these animals that, that represent 
rebirth and spiritual growth keep coming into my life, and I'm very grateful. Now, there is an article on N5D.com where you can basically look up any animal. And the easiest way to do it is if there's an animal that comes into your life, there's a search bar on the upper right-hand corner of every page on N5D. Just type in the animal, and you'll get led to that article. So getting back to what we were saying before, I was asking you uh, which religion, if you had to ultimately make a choice, you would choose, and you chose the religion of the fairy. Um, <laughs> Thanks. You made that sound so beautiful. <laughs> okay, we're, we're kind of you know Native American also. I, I really uh-huh. do. I you yeah. know, I do have an affinity for that. But I think most people who you know are alive today have, at some point have had lives as you know Native Amer you know Native Americans or Native Canadians, just some type of a the Native person in their own country. And I can agree with that one too, you know, and uh, just honoring the elements basically and uh, what they represent, honoring every every sentient being living and non-living uh, on this planet. I can definitely uh, relate to that. Also, you know, personally, I, I would probably tend to lean towards Gnosticism. I do believe in an all-loving higher source, creator, power, whatever you want to call this entity just not the bipolar God that's in the Bible that's all loving one chapter and then he's pissed off and kills everybody in, in another chapter. And I, I just can't relate to that. And I, I, I do, honestly, and I come from the heart when I say this, I do respect and honor those who do. My parents are Christians. They, um, they've been Christians for the longest time. I, I grew up in a Methodist church and almost got kicked out of it, basically, in Sunday school, no less, for questioning my Sunday school teacher on the origins of mankind. Well, you know, it's good to see that you haven't changed at all since then, because <laughs> I'm pretty sure that you're still, you know, getting kicked out by somebody from somewhere, you know, or you know that the, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses see your door and run, <laughs> or they see you coming down the street. They're like, steer clear of them, steer clear. Well, it's funny that you brought that up, because... <laughs> A few weeks ago, I got visited by some Jehovah's Witnesses. These two ladies came by, and uh, they knocked on my door and asked me if I had a little time to talk with them. I said, sure. So uh, I'm. meanwhile, my dog is barking at them, probably saying, get out of here. But uh, we, uh, we talked a lot, and I kept asking them all these questions that I had have a lot of questions about. For example, I asked uh, a question about Genesis 1 verse 26 where it says let us make man in our own image so i asked them who is us in our and i knew what their answer would be the father son and the holy ghost now this is genesis before the son was even born so it can't be the son and then i asked them well and i told them that i said well who do you think it really is well we'll have to get back to you on that and then i i asked them how did noah gather two of every animal that was not indigenous to the middle east such as penguins, sea lions, and polar bears. And once again, they had no answer. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, and these are great questions. I mean, anybody that's really trying to explore uh, the origins of mankind, your own religion, faith, go through the text. Question everything, honestly, whatever there is. Question everything we're talking about today on In5D Radio. It's funny, these two ladies were, were squirming trying to answer my questions, and we spoke for over an hour and before they said they had to leave, and they asked if they could come back next week, and I said, sure, but they never returned. I, yeah, and I don't think they'll ever return. <laughs> <laughs> I think they don't like you. Aw, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> they, they have to like me. I don't love, think they like you. Love thy neighbor. I don't think they love you as a neighbor. <laughs> Aw, I don't think they'll be dropping anything by at your house anymore either or, or inviting you to their church. That's sad. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you'll just have to make friends elsewhere. Now, are there any verses or any things that you question about the Bible? Well, you know, I, um, again, I, gosh, can you pronounce that site, the Biblio? Please pronounce it for me. I can't do it. I don't know how it's pronounced, but I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> and everybody that is anybody that's been in this genre for X amount of years knows exactly what Sherry's talking about. Why couldn't they pick an easier website name? Because it just, I can barely pronounce it or write it, but they have the greatest information. I think it's like Biblio Cat Blaze 
something like that. I'm so <laughs> Oh, God, I hope they forgive me. I'm trying to give them credit because, uh-huh. it, honestly, it's an awesome site. It is. But there is a, um, an article there called The Dark Bible, mm-hmm. and it, it, it does address a lot of the issues of, you know, of that, you know, God would be this person that, you know, wants, that would kill children and kill babies and other stuff like that. And it makes you say, you know, gosh, you know, that's, that just doesn't, that doesn't seem right. Like, that doesn't seem okay. That doesn't seem like a loving type of of being. And I feel love in my soul. And I'm a loving person, and I wouldn't do that. And if I'm part of God, then that doesn't make sense. Something's not working. So I, I think that, you know, I think some things of the Bible are very beautiful, and they're great ideals to live by, and they, there are some great messages and some are very beautiful, and some make sense to me, and I appreciate them. And I just think it's like anything else. You can kind of take out you can take out what you want out of it and appreciate what you want out of it. And other stuff just doesn't make sense. But then again, maybe some of other people's religions is the same thing. Maybe they could, you know, still be, you know, a Buddhist, but they'd say, you know, maybe 75% of this makes sense to me, maybe 25% doesn't. So it's probably similar in all religions, don't you think? Uh, Chances are yes. Now, I I find it interesting that there's an article I posted on N5D News today, and the title says, 800 children bodies found in a mass septic tank grave at a Catholic church in Ireland. Well, you know, they, they found that with the, you know, there's a, an enormous lawsuit at this point um, that you're, I'm sure you're aware of with the, you know, the genocide of the native Canadian children that were sent to the, you know, the native schools there that, you know, were visited by, you know, the queen and her entourage and, and all these children ended up missing and unaccounted for and found in mass graves and, you know, who knows what who knows what happened. But there is a huge lawsuit over this at this point because, you know, someone has decided that this is no longer okay. Mm-hmm. That now that we know about it, we're not gonna pretend we don't know about it and we're not gonna say, Okay, we know this happened and we're just gonna brush it under the rug. People have said, you know what, this happened and this is disgusting and what really happened and you know, so there's actually a huge lawsuit over this at this point, and there should be. And I'm glad that somebody's doing it. And it may even be uh, Kevin Annette. Yes. Yes, I was just going to bring that up. Uh, Kevin Annette has been doing some amazing uh, work in really uncovering all the atroci- atrocities, the, the crimes against humanity and all the trafficking that the Roman Catholic Church has been doing. Now, I've been saying this for quite a while in the articles I've been writing on in 5D, that because we're in Pluto and Capricorn right now, Pluto's known as the destroyer, and it's going to tear down everything that is not in humanity's best interest, including money, religion, and government. And what I see happening is that the Roman Catholic Church will be dissolved, and their net worth will be distributed to everyone on the planet, and that would create instant abundance for everyone. Now, we all know that they have enough net worth to feed, clothe, and shelter everybody on this planet. So imagine how much that would help each individual person as we transition out of money eventually. But in the meanwhile, to give you that kind of economic security until we do actually transition out of money. I mean, it would be really wonderful if it happens. And I, I certainly am hopeful that that it would happen. And I, I try to think positively about it instead of, you know, negatively. That, that's all I can say is it, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea. Mm-hmm. And if it comes to fruition and I can help manifest it in my mind mm-hmm. and other people can and it can happen, then, you know, that, that's awesome. What I'm going to do, I see a couple callers in the queue. I'm not sure if they're listening or not, but what we're going to do is just um, put them on, on the air and see if they have a question. We have area code 404. You're on N5D radio with Greg and Sherry. Do you have a question for us? 404. And we'll put you back on hold. And we'll go to area code 224. You're on N5D radio with Greg and Sherry. Can we get your name, please? And area code 224 is listening. So we'll get back to um, our conversation. My mother... (laughs) 
bless her soul. Uh, she she'll argue that you know our church does a lot of good things for the community, and I'll tell her why do you need a church to do good things for other people? Well, I mean sometimes it's it's easy to coordinate people through a through an organization also. Okay, you can join her church. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just you know I mean sometimes I think that it it, it gives people a sense of belonging to. Uh, you know, a community type of does help them organize themselves better to, to accomplish things. And, and so I say, eh, no matter how they do it, as long as they accomplish good things, you know, then that's okay with me. Mm-hmm. So your mom's okay with me going to church. I don't <laughs> mind. I'll still like her, and I'll still invite her over for dinner. Okay. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to move on to our next way that children are being brainwashed, and this is through ridiculous role models. And I'd like to remind anyone, if you want to call in and talk about any one of these topics, it doesn't matter whether we're still on the topic or not, call in anytime. Our phone number is 646-716-8890. Okay, now for the guys listening, how many times did you play cowboys and Indians when you were a kid? And what about the ladies? How many of you played with Barbie dolls? Did you own a a Barbie doll, Sherry? Did I own a Barbie doll? How many Barbie dolls did you own? (laughs) I owned them. I owned all of them, and my daughter additionally got, I think she got every one that came out, including the Barbie that was like three feet top, you know, tall, um, and she got the flying, I mean, she had everything. She and she was so cute because she was an only child for a while, and she would go into her bedroom, and she they would all have conversations with each other, and she would do different voices for them, and sometimes I would, like, be stalking outside the room, and I would just listen to it because it was so cute because they would have these conversations and talk to each other. Of oh. course, there was... Of course, there's only one man, so there's like the 20 girl Barbies and then one guy. So, (laughs) unfortunately, you know, (laughs) that's the way Barbies work. Well, ultimately, we have to ask ourselves, what message does Barbie really send our daughters? First off, there is an expectation of what you should look like, which is similar to the models they use on the covers of Cosmo. Of course, Barbie owns the latest convertible sports car, so that teaches our children materialism. I know know my sisters played with Barbie dolls, and they mimicked the traditional role models of women at that period in time, so that's another distorted expectation from playing with Barbie dolls. How do you see that? Well, I mean, I I think it's... I, I'm going to criticize the shape of Barbie more than anything mm-hmm. because it's such an unrealistic shape that 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 is really unattainable. I think that's my big gripe. Other than that, I mean, I think it's fine for you know girls to play with dolls, and and I, I think that's part of you know a part of learning how to take care of a baby is playing with baby dolls. Like I, I just think that I don't know. I don't think that's sexist. I think it's just being for real. That you know I give you know of course I give my child options of what they want to play with, but you know girls just seem to gravitate to want. You know when they choose their toys themselves, they choose to want to pick the girl toys and, you know, babies and stuff like that. I, maybe that's just genetic. Well, it seems like there's an expectation, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this in, uh, when we talk about TV, but there's, there's an expectation of what a woman should look like and act like and, you know, the, the roles that they play. And that kind of gets in, uh, ingrained into the children at a young age uh, when they're playing with these toys. Now, our boys and some girls uh, played with cowboys, well, not played with, they played cowboys and Indians, or they played with uh, those G.I. Joe type of toys. Now, the whole cowboy and Indian game is just asinine and embarrassing, especially to any indigenous population. Not only that, but it's just like today's video games. These toys desensitize our children into thinking that killing someone is okay. Your thoughts? Oh, I, you know, I mean, I I agree. I really agree because, um, you know, that's one of the issues that I'm having with my 11 year old is that, um, you know, some of the video games. You know, I, I'm I'm he did play for a long time with the Lego the Lego games, which I'm okay with because he loves Legos. And after that, he sort of evolved to going up to, um, 
you know, Halo and, you know, it's like, okay, you're killing aliens. I don't know. They're bad aliens somehow. That's a little bit okay. But, you know, when he, when he started to get to wanting to play, you know, like Assassin's Creed and other things like that, I'm kind of like, wow, like this is really, this is not okay. This is not okay. And so, um, so I, I definitely think that it gets them desensitized. I, I 100% agree that it does start to, to, you know, desensitize them to death and killing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if, if, but, uh, but at the same time, you know, we're also in a society that has to create armies. And we have to create men that are willing to go into these uh, fields. And if there is no, if these games aren't available and, you know, cowboys and Indians aren't available, then how are they going to, how are they going to start these kids off to end up becoming soldiers one day that they actually need, right? By target shooting instead of pretending to kill other people, just hitting targets. Well, I mean, you know, I suppose it's more fun, you know, if you're, it might be more fun to hit something and see it explode, you know, and see gore everywhere. I mean, I I think, (laughs) I think that's the pulp to it, which is terrible, than just hitting a target. I guess a tar- you see hit a target. Well, wow, okay, great. I'm I'm actually uh, I actually excelled in archery, and it's one of it's one of my um, ancient weapon skills. You know, is archery and uh, shooting with a crossbow. I always thought it was pretty exciting. I never shot anything. I absolutely I, I don't hunt, but I am prepared for a zombie apocalypse. Oh. Like, you will <laughs> you will want me on your side because I do have great aim. I would only need a few arrows. I could get somebody a good shot. So I just I figure as you know, as a parent, as a mother, in case this should ever happen, I'm prepared. And I'll be throwing rocks. I I, I, I don't own a gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean I don't I don't own a gun either, but I do have um I do have a couple of katana swords. Uh, you know, honestly I think some of this is uh leftover um cell memories mm-hmm. from you know, different different lives doing yeah. different things. Because I, I know when I, I was in Europe and I saw these swords there in a in a shop and I was so attracted to them. I thought they were the most amazing things I'd ever seen. And I was like, I have to have them and I ended up dragging them all through Europe for two months. And it was a lot of fun trying to stick them in the suitcases and carry them around because these uh, katana swords, you know, they're about three feet long. Mm-hmm. So, but <laughs> all I can say is, is that it is, it is, you know, when Andrew Bartzis did a reading on me one time, he was like, well, you were, you know, you were a really high warrior. And that's one reason why, you know, you still have this affinity for this. And that was on the N5D radio show. It it was it was it was very it was very interesting and it was it did explain a lot because I do get flashbacks every once in a while of the, I would say the equivalent of being a ninja like mm-hmm. I get these flashes in my head of just literally spinning around with weapons and stuff and I think God I'm so cool but um <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed with myself. <laughs> a girl. Yeah, so so I definitely I can hold my own if you know in case the zombie apocalypse ever does happen, mm-hmm. um, I will defend us. Now I see a familiar number in the queue. We have area code eight one seven online with us, and this would be Michelle Walling, editor of Cosmic Star Seeds, uh, in five D author and host of the. Cosmic Awakening Show on N5D Radio. There we go. Hi, Michelle. You You're me? live with us. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Sherry. Hi. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Thanks so much for um, helping out in the chat room so much. And uh, I really appreciate it because you're just working it there. Her and Larry, oh, her co host. Yeah. Great job Larry. Hi, Larry. <laughs> yeah, we're having fun in the chat room talking about you guys. <laughs> and I see, uh, I see Kendra there, too. Hi, Kendra. Hi, Kendra. <laughs> and Andrew Fisher just left. He had to go sun gaze. I he saw said, that. I was reading along. <laughs> yeah, he said, uh, he said, I know you guys are going to miss me not calling in, but I have to go sun gaze. <laughs> but what I wanted to, <laughs> what I wanted to, to talk about, um, I'm going to skip probably, I'm going to hit some of your subjects that you haven't mentioned yet. But I wanted to kind of go on a timeline here with mind control with children. 
and I think that it starts with uh, vaccines. You know, there's something there's something in those vaccines that we don't know about, and um, I think I think it affects the way that our children think. I mean, I think it might even you know block the pineal gland, which you know ke- you know keeps you aware and awake and open. And I, you know, except for our indigo children, and except for uh, you know, fortunately for for children who are born into families that are um, aware of vaccines and can avoid vaccines. Um, that's a huge part in, uh, in our indigo children's, uh, uh, raising our indigo children these days. But then from there with the vaccines, I think it goes, um, you know, to the food, to the advertising on television for all these GMO cereals with sugar and uh, with all the fast food that's available these days, that as well is going to keep our children just kind of like in a, in a zombie-like state and, you know, Sherry was mentioning that um, you know she's prepared for the zombie apocalypse, but you know I think we're already there. I think people are walking around just in you know dazed right now and confused. <laughs> uh, so I think um, I think we're going to need something other than you know slingshots or rocks. <laughs> I think we're going to need awareness for this zombie apocalypse. Oh, I, you know, I, I agree too. And the vaccines, I, I can say from personal experience that, you know, I've, my child has been diagnosed um, with ADHD. Of course, they say it doesn't exist. However, that being said, he has some definite issues that, I've used nutrition, I've taken out preservatives, I've done everything I can. It, you know, it has not made a difference. And what happened is, is he was, he was uh, uh, starting to walk very early, talk very early, everything was perfect. He got the MMR vaccine and he stopped talking. He completely stopped talking. Wow. And you could base, he, it's, it's almost like he developed autism and he, you know, you could bang a pan in back of his head and he wouldn't even turn. And I thought maybe he was becoming deaf. And so because mm-hmm. he, he stopped talking and wasn't listening and we were kind of like, what's happened with the child? And then that lessened to the ADHD. So I'm not sure if ADHD could be from leftover neurological damage from the vaccine. Like, for example, mm-hmm. like, I, you know, I'm not a scientist, but that if if he did suffer some type of autistic type of reaction, that lessened to the point where it was just showing up more as what they now call ADHD, because the timing mm-hmm. of it it, it, it it coordinated too well. There was no no mm-hmm. other way to look at it. It happened right at that right at the MMR time. Just stop talking. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that that um, could occur and cause a lot of uh, false diagnoses for ADHD. And some of our indigo and crystal children are born, um, you know, very hypersensitive, hyperreactive, and with a lot of energy bouncing around. And they're also, uh, as well, a lot of those kids are misdiagnosed with ADHD simply because, you know, that's the next thing I was going to talk about. They don't, they don't like sitting in school all day. You know, they need to be creative. They need to share their energy with other people and move around. And, you know, school is one of the biggest, um, besides television, school is one of the biggest things used uh, to mind control our children. And um, Greg Greg and I co-authored an article called uh, The Future of Education, a school that you would want to attend on N5D.com, and we, um, we discuss you know, the topics that are being taught in school now and how, you know, how they're basically a program designed around um, grooming our children for, you know, sitting in office jobs all day and being a slave worker for the system and as well as, um, you know, grooming them for going to military and going going to war. You know, I, I don't feel like, um, I don't feel like we need to, prepare our children for war, I think, um, I, I believe it starts with the parents to, you know, to really seriously have an, have an impact. If anything, on a, on a late teenager's life, um, you know, not, not allowing it, just not allowing it. I mean, the wars are all created 
uh, for for monetary value. So um, that's that's an agenda as as well as school. And one other thing um, I wanted to talk about is the the article that I wrote, How to Raise the Magic of the Force Within You, and it talks about um, you know television as being one of the biggest mind control things on everyone in the in the home. And, you know, a lot of people have, like, a television in every room. And, you know, here's just a little example, especially on, I would think, on cartoons and on sitcoms and things that kids might watch, is that they like, for instance, they have laugh tracks on there that are laughter from various um, incongruent people laughing, and they kind of put it together, and it's kind of all mishmashed. And it, what it does is it ends up being a disharmonious wave of energy, and that energy comes out of the television through sound and comes into our body, and it vibrates our cells, and it creates like a false energy environment. And we're taught to laugh at someone who's in pain or a difficult situation. So when the kids are glued to cartoons all day and they're taking you know, mallets and hitting each other over the head and blowing each other up with dynamite, and things like that, I mean, it's really creating a false reality uh, other than love. And so I think television is a huge part of, of programming, uh, you know, the programming the brainwashing for our kids, you know, to let's, let's groom them for war to go out and bash people, you know. Well, how many times do you, do you watch a sitcom and – one of the characters will say something, and you hear this laughter, this canned laughter in the background, and you're thinking to yourself, that wasn't funny. Who would really laugh at that? Mm-hmm. I, I was oh, just I saying was that my dog, say. but she, went, she went to go see Chelsea lately because mm-hmm. um, some guy she likes was the guest on the show. So she got to her tickets, went to go see Chelsea lately, sat in the audience, and everything that she said was on cards, and they did have the – the fake, it said laugh now, and she was so disappointed because, you know, in her mind, she had thought that this was very spontaneous, and she was so disappointed that it was like, oh, my God, even that's canned, too. Like, I thought Chelsea lately was at least, you know, it was real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, Michelle and I were talking about cartoon characters, um, and if you go to the grocery store, there's a few articles on the Internet about this. Take a look at the eyes of these cereal box mascots like Cap'n Crunch or whatever else. The eyes are set at nine, to look down 9.6 degrees right into your children's eyes. This is how they use marketing against you. So the child's sitting in the cart, and they see Cap'n Crunch looking down at them. I want that. I want that, Mommy. And I'm telling you, there's a psychology behind this that – there's a reason why the colors they use are the colors that, that, that you see and why, where the eyes are looking. Everything behind that box is definitely worked out to a T to get you to buy that product. Absolutely. It's, it's almost best to either, you know, to try to get a babysitter or get your spouse to watch the kids while, while you go to the store because the only other way to avoid this, um, this marketing Scheme that they have in the in the middle of the aisles is to stay on the outside aisles where all the all the fresh food is. I mean, just think if you never took your child down a cereal aisle, they would never learn that. They would never know mm-hmm. that. Like, got an old, old enough to go by themselves. And some people, like um, you know, like Kendra Gilbert, our friend, she you know she's taught her her son at an early age um, the good stuff to eat. I mean. My son, unfortunately, I was uh, really asleep when I raised him, and um, you know, I I just was on a fixed income, and I bought cheap foods, and you know, he he was raised on all that crap, and uh, he he doesn't like fruits and vegetables. We're really I'm really struggling to work on that. He's 17 now, and he still eats out, you know, fast food. It's just a lifestyle that's been programmed for us from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. One thing I'm curious about, why are there no female cereal mascots? <laughs> well, that's a funny ever thing to that? be curious about. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, Greg, I've never wondered that. I have never – yeah, that's really never <laughs> – I've mind. always wondered that. You're so <laughs> random. <laughs> I don't wonder either. 
her. <laughs> okay, gosh. We're going to go and knows how to keep later. it light. <laughs> but those are just a few things that I wanted to, to, you know, to come on and chat about. I love what you guys are doing, and I appreciate you being on the radio for, for everybody who's listening. Aw, okay. thank you, Michelle. Okay, well, we y'all have a, a, a wonderful evening. Love to both. Okay, and if you, do, if you want to call back in later, if something else chimes up, feel free to do so. <laughs> okay, Greg. Thanks All right. Lot. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Do you see that we have another caller who wanted to comment on the role models that we have in some of the music industry? Okay. If you would like to take that call. I'm not sure which one that is, but we're just going to take the one that's been holding the longest. There's one. It's at 760. All right, then. Th- there it is. 760, you're on in 5D radio with Greg and Sherry. Can we get your name, please? This is Jessica. Hi, Jessica. And how do we know you? I'm Sherry's daughter. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Jessica, everyone. And uh, she'll be Hello. hopefully starting a show on N5D Radio. Hopefully. Reaching out to the uh, Indigo kids that are out there. Indeed. All righty. Uh, so, well, so ahead, Jessica, Mom. the question is, what do you think about the role models currently for children and younger people that are a lot of the people in the music industry? And what is your opinion about that? There are certain people in the music industry in every genre of music that definitely have music that's not really has a purpose, honestly. Like, it's like meaningless words, meaningless music. It doesn't really have anything to offer your mind. I'm not going to list any of the artists, not going to hurt their feelings because they may just be puppets. But there are certain artists that I love that are in rap and isn't like the most awesome genre that people look at because it's so negative and whatnot. A lot of rappers, their outlet was they didn't really have one. There was no one they could talk to. There was no one that they could be sensitive with or show compassion towards. So they wrote about it and later found out, I'm going to rap about it. And a lot of these rappers are just storytellers trying to have their point across and some of it is just terrible. Not just meaning wise, but sound wise, it's just awful. But I love rap. I've heard certain rap that hits me in the spirit, in the soul. And I can't say that this person's the best role model for me, but I'm smart enough to make the difference between going and hearing like them doing a drive by and versus me doing a drive by. This is just them saying their lives. It doesn't mean that I'm gonna go hop in an old chef like Chevelle and grab some AK forty seven and go ha- Chevelle, thank you. And go crazy and, like, shoot up my neighborhood. No, I'm probably going to go walk to Starbucks and not really do anything. I honestly think that music can be very powerful and it can manipulate people. But at the same time, you should be mentally strong enough to make the difference between being aggressive. And even Miley Cyrus, some of her music is a little subliminal. I don't think a bunch of 14-year-old girls are going to go ham like she does, but that doesn't mean that there isn't girls who do that because there are. So she has definitely manipulated a certain amount of people, but not all of them. There is artists that are horrible and they are manipulating people, and they're getting paid to do it, and, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. We can talk about it for 15 minutes or we can, you know, just not listen to them and not buy the music and not have anything to do with them and tell our kids, you know, how about you don't listen to these people because they're not good and if we're not listening to them, you know, monkey see, monkey do. My mom's not walking around the house listening to, like, killer clown music, so I haven't been. I know I know but, your mom does listen to a lot of the music I listened to back in the 80s, as well as uh, Michelle. Yeah. We all listened mm-hmm. to pretty much the same music, all this hard rock. At the time, once again, they had the same issues with, look at the lyrics that you're listening to. You're, it's going to make you a bad person. You know, mm-hmm. One of the examples they, they used was uh, Ozzy Osbourne's... Uh, what was that? Suicide something. Ah. Suicide solution. But uh, yes. yeah, that's not gonna, You know, it's it's not going to cause people. It takes a mental imbalance for that to happen. Not not just a, a bunch of words. I can listen to a song by Van Halen called "Ain't Talking About Love," and feel 100% love listening to it. Everyone loves Van Halen. Good. 
good artist. Mm -hmm. I saw Van Halen in person. I saw them at the auditorium in Fort Lauderdale. (laughs) I did. I, I, I I think I was down in, if I wasn't in the front row, I was about five rows back, and it was when they still had, um, oh, my God, my age is coming on. Who is the lead singer of Van Halen original? David Lee Roth. David Lee Roth. Be quiet. So David Lee Roth was still there, and he had his leggings on, his striped leggings, and he was going from one part of the stage to the other, and it was probably the most awesome concert I ever went to. And the the craziest thing is, is at this time, um, oh, gosh, I think the sportatorium held Oh, gosh, it could have helped 15,000 people. It was an indoor one. And the place was so full of pot smoke that you literally got high, whether you smoked or not, you know, and it was just crazy. So it was was so funny because sometimes you could barely see the artist because the place was so full of smoke. It was kind of funny. Well, that sounds funny. Technically, I was there, so awesome. (laughs) You weren't there. Well, you... Well, yeah, you were because you were an ex. Mm-hmm. I was carrying you, so you were. I'm sorry, you were there. That was her first but. concert. <laughs> <laughs> that was. Way to go, Sherry. <laughs> see, I did. I brought my kids. She did. See, she was exposed to music. Mm-hmm. <laughs> She's right. <laughs> okay. You know what? Um, she uh, Jessica has left the building. Okay. <laughs> Jessica was on a cell phone that wasn't completely charged. I, I. And it, 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 it was mine. <laughs> Sorry. And <Anyway. laughs> that was my kid. My kid went to a concert recently out in California, and it was by um, Ab Soul, who is um, one of the few rappers that's actually a spiritual rapper, and he raps about um, very, you know, topics that are very enlightened topics um, about spirituality, the pineal gland, and different things. If you've ever had a chance to listen to his music, his music is very, very interesting, and he has a very interesting history as well. Mm -hmm. But he had a concert with um, some other rappers, and it was actually at, um, I think it was like UCSD campus. It was at a cafe that was at a university. And if you paid $6 more, you were allowed to smoke pot at it. Oh my God! That's how crazy it is out here. So that's it. If you, I mean, and I thought that's one of the weirdest things I've ever heard of. Like you pay six dollars more and you can smoke a pot there. Like <laughs> some of these things don't make sense to me. I have to admit, one of them. That was one of the strange <laughs> things. I mean. <laughs> so what about some of the role models in music, such as Miley Cyrus, Britney Spears, or Jay Z? How do role models in music influence influence our kids, Sherry? Well, you know, it's so funny because I just saw a meme that I posted on my Facebook, and it says, it said, Miley Cyrus, you know, licks a hammer, you know, and and everybody, you know, everybody's, you know, all excited, and, you know, I I lick a hammer naked, and they throw me out of Home Depot, and so, (laughs) I'm sorry, I guess that didn't go over too well. Do do you lick hams often? (laughs) (laughs) No, it was, it was, I think it was that. Uh, oh gosh, you know what? I'm not the greatest joke teller, uh, clearly, but it was. I think it was basically like she licks a hammer and is drunk, and everybody's like rah rah, and I lick one in Home Depot naked, and you know. Okay, did I still destroy the joke again? Did I do it twice? I, I thought actually, I thought you said ham instead of hammer. No, a hammer. You know. Okay. You no, know, when she did that performance, <laughs> when she had that big. You know, hammer. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eats. Okay, so she was half nude and licked the hammer. Hammer. And the meme was, when I licked a hammer naked, they threw me out of Home Depot. <laughs> okay. Stop. You know what? Time. <laughs> you know what? It's time for the laugh track. <laughs> yeah, Michelle. Give us that laugh track. <laughs> we need the laugh track. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I guess it was more funny if you saw it. <laughs> Tom Schultz is the founder and lead guitarist of the band Boston, and he runs the DTS Charitable Foundation, which helps in areas of animal protection and education, children protection, and food and shelter programs. He's also a vegetarian and offers resources on his website that include PETA and Vegan Outreach. 
You know, Sherry, it, it would be really cool if we could get him as a guest on N5D Radio to talk about some of that stuff. Oh, well, I mean, I, I love Boston. You know, one of my favorite songs, Don't Look Back. And, um, you know, I grew up with a lot of that. In fact, I remember hearing, God, I don't even want to age myself, but, you know, unfortunately I have to when um, I had Boston on 8-track. <laughs> their album so this might be a long time ago what's an eight track are you serious yeah that's before my time oh my god don't be so evil (laughs) (laughs) that's not nice (laughs) i'm kidding i'm kidding no i actually i remember buying my sister lola an eight track of toys in the attic by aerosmith for christmas one year oh toys in the attic's awesome Mm mm-hmm so you know who I'd, who I'd also like to get on N5D Radio? Sammy Hagar and have him talk about his UFO experience. You just like him because he looks like you. No. I think that's it, yeah. Because people used to call you. That's probably why you named your dog Sammy, isn't it? I'd also like to get David Lee Roth, <laughs> who has a black belt in the martial arts. So you know he has a spiritual side, too. You know what? He, I, I love him. I mean, I really think he's... He's uh, uh, he has so much charisma. He really does. He has the greatest charisma. Like I'm so sorry that I didn't get a chance to see them in concert when they reunited mm-hmm. because it didn't seem to last very long. But you know, thank God people filmed it, so it was on YouTube, and I got to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, oh gosh, I would have loved to see them reunited again because he still has the voice. He still has a voice. A lot of them, a lot of them, their their voice is kind of, you know, once they start getting out there a little bit, the voices start to go. But he still has it. Mm-hmm. So did no. Journey. Did you just hear the lead singer of uh, former lead singer of Journey just came in briefly for um, a visit to a, I think it was a cafe or some kind of small venue. No, first I didn't. time in tw- first time in twenty years. I just saw it on YouTube, and uh, Steve Perry. He still has huh? a voice. Wow, he had an amazing voice. He uh, still does. You know, and, and, and speaking anyway of, of guests, next week our guest will be Sherry Edwards, who developed a sound technology that can cure little, literally everything. So be sure to tune in on that. Plus, I'll be releasing an article tonight about that. So definitely check out the article and be sure you check back next week on in 5 d Radio to hear the interview with Sherry. Now, in sports, there are there are a lot of good role models, such as Drew Brees and Brandon Marshall in, in the NFL, but you still see these players who get busted for repeating drug use and domestic violence and gun-related issues. Uh, in, in, in baseball, we have players like Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds who are basically teaching our children that you need, you need to cheat with per- performance-enhancing drugs in order to stay competitive, competitive in this sport. What are your thoughts about that? You're, you know, I'm a chick. I'm sorry. You're, asking, you're talking about the wrong, you know, neighborhood for me here for this question. But, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, I mean, I, I think it's part of the – I also think it's part of the money because a lot of, a lot of these people, you know, they've gone from very, very basic, simple upbringings to all of a sudden having millions and millions of dollars. And, mm-hmm. and honestly, I think some of it just has to do with the money, you know, you, you – get a certain lifestyle simply by having that money it's just so tempting Mm -hmm. especially if you grew up and you didn't have it if all of a sudden you can afford you know brand new corvette and a ferrari and this and that i mean it just seems like it's part of the part of the you know the, the temptation of that money i agree and that that's the perfect transition into uh number the the number three way of how our children are being brainwashed and that's money ego and materialism so remember as a kid when adults would ask you, so Sherry, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, you know, honestly, I wanted to be an archaeologist. I really did. I loved everything about, you know, Egypt and Babylonia, and I absolutely adored that stuff. That stuff turned me on like crazy. Such and, a nerd. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, would have, I would have made a great Indiana Jones, okay? I already have some of the, the weapon skills. I'm curious. Um, I would have loved – I don't mind snakes. I would have been okay with that. Um, and so, and I love history. So I love that. And my dad talked me out of that. He said it doesn't – you know, it's not really a very good 
paying. And, uh, and then I decided, well, I'm going to be a marine biologist then because I was a scuba diver. And it was like, well, again, that's not really a great, you know, paying thing or that's not, you know. And so I think I was kind of at that point, I think because, um, because of the way that I was raised, um, I ended up choosing two fields. Really, I chose them just for the money. Law and accounting. I said, okay, well, how's this? How's law and accounting? And it was like, you know, okay, that's good. Mm-hmm. And the, I, the ironic thing is, is I really didn't do much with either of them. So it was almost wasted. And, yeah. and the point is, is that you have to go into something because it's meaningful to you and you mm-hmm. want to do it and you're excited to do it because that's what makes it not work. That's what makes it fulfilling and good and you know of course I probably could have picked a field of law that you know that that I loved and so what I I tried to make it work with family law I thought I'm going to go in there I'm going to make a difference I'm going to you know work in family law as a paralegal and then I saw how the court system worked and how people fought over custody and the, the pettiest things and just how the kids were treated it was one of the worst experiences of my life so instead of going in there trying to make to say I'm going to make it better I'm going to make a difference I just said oh my god this is probably the most horrible place of law I could go other than criminal law mm-hmm. I mean, you know that from being, you know, from being a family and marriage therapist, you, you know, you know what it's like, but on the court end, it was just, it was the worst thing I'd ever seen. It was honestly just terrible. Now I noticed in the chat room, Gemini Moon said that she also wanted to be an archaeologist when she was growing up. So you're not alone. <laughs> Woohoo! You know, my, my daughter loves it too. My daughter loves it. My son loves it. I mean, it's very exciting. I know history is very, very exciting. And, um, you know, and, it, and it's, it's, it's interesting. And, you know, we, we have so, you know, thank God they've, you know, uncovered a lot of sites. I personally went to um, Pompeii. And that was one of the weirdest experiences, most surreal, because when you go to Pompeii, you actually can go into the rooms where people are petrified. Mm-hmm. They, they're, they're, bron- they're basically bronzed with lava, and you can see them in their positions, and some of it's very, um, it's, it's very weird. And very surreal, and it had a. It really didn't have a great vibration for me, but I'm still glad I went because it was a very interesting experience. And um, they had dug for years and years before they even got to the point where they found these structures and these people. Everything was buried, and so things like that. I think everyone likes to dig. Don't I mean? Don't you? Didn't when you were a kid like go and dig? for things and hope you'd find something. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll tell you what, I know a lot of people listening, they, they looked for fossils or have a love for gemstones. They probably wanted one of those uh, gemstone, gemstone tumblers when they were kids so they could make all these cool rocks. Um, so, yeah, the, I, I, can, I can definitely appreciate that part. I know I had a fascination about fossils myself, and so there is an aspect of archaeology that I can, I can relate to, definitely. Now, when I was a kid, I wanted to be the commander for the Galactic Federation of Light, but my parents talked me out of it. So, are you kidding? Were you? Did you really? You don't even know about that. <laughs> Come on. Yes, I'm serious. No. <laughs> I'm like, you don't even know about that. Then. No, really. What did you really want to do? Well, honestly, I I don't remember. Although I was always interested in learning how to play guitar, so I guess my dream was to be a musician, which I did as a lead and rhythm guitarist in several hard rock bands throughout the 80s. Well, I have heard some of your um, playing over the telephone before, and what I heard I thought was wonderful. I have have been told by one of my friends that I have a guitar fetish, which I didn't appreciate the comment that much, but I actually think I do have one um, because – Whatever I hear somebody playing the electric guitar, I don't know. It does something to me. It could be I, – I don't even want to describe it. It probably – I'd probably end up not becoming your co-host anymore, so I don't want to put you graphic in the description. But, um, but I do. There's something about hearing an electric guitar that just – it excites my brain so much that it will stop me from wherever, whatever I'm doing. I'm looking around like, where's that coming from? Where's that coming from? I, I feel that way when I hear um, C 
souped up car engines too. If there's a Mustang with like a 500 in it, you know, a GT or something, and I can hear it coming and I'll hear that sound. And all of a sudden I'm looking around getting that same, you know, kind of, you know, excitement. I do that with the electric guitar and I do that with uh, car motors. There you go, folks. <laughs> <laughs> That's you all want, you need, right? right you want to impress here. Sherry? Learn how to play guitar and buy yourself a nice car, like a Chevelle or something. Mustang with a 500cc engine. and You're guaranteed a date. You're guaranteed a date. <laughs> oh, gosh. That's just, boy, I just sold myself out cheap, mm-hmm. didn't I? Yeah. Now, I'll tell you, what, what you don't hear children saying is, I want to be a healer or I want to teach Reiki. Most of the time, Parents will try to persuade their children to follow some lucrative job and chase the almighty dollar while kissing corporate ass instead of following whatever their true divine path might be. Um, you, you know, um, I, I, again, I think part of it is, you know, what the parents expose their children to in the home also. Mm-hmm. It really is. You know, my, um, my son, you know, I've always, I've always known that both my children had healing abilities and I've encouraged that with them. And so um, so my daughter knows that she, um, part of hers is with touching. And my son does that simply by being kind. And he, he will be, he's sort of, you know, I, a little bit weird. He kind of puts people off because they're not used to a little kid coming up to them and saying, you know, hi, how's your day? How are you? I hope everything's going well. They're kind of looking at him like, is there something wrong with this kid? But... <laughs> But he's just, he's being kind, and that's his form of healing is that he smiles and he asks people how they're doing, and, you know, and he has beautiful green eyes, and so mm-hmm. um, so they're, they're a little off-put by him, but at the same time, I tell him that's your healing ability. You're sending out your healing when you do this, and so he's happy. So he's happy and excited to do it. Now, I was looking in the chat room, and Michelle was talking about money, and she says, she said that it teaches our kids to go to school and go to college and to take out a loan they can't pay for and then to struggle to make a living and give them money through taxes. So it's, it's this, this vicious cycle that we end up going around uh, chasing the almighty dollar. Now, speaking of dollars, um, I know growing up there's all these board games like Life and Monopoly. Uh, I know I played them as a kid, and I, I'm sure you did too. What what life lessons did you learn from Monopoly, Sherry? Well, you know, interesting enough, <laughs> I saw another another meme. I don't know. You know, I'm a very visual person, so I tend to notice um, visual things. Mm-hmm. And there was another meme that I saw that showed a dollar bill and a Monopoly dollar bill, and it said the only difference between these is that you place value on one and not the other. Because really that's what it is. They're both just a piece of paper mm-hmm. that, that's not really backed by anything. Mm-hmm. And so what I learned at Monopoly is, is that I wasn't very good at it, and, it, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I don't have patience for it. And so I wouldn't I, – when people wanted to – play Monopoly, I'm like, oh, crap, I'm, I'm going to be, this is like a four-hour event. So um, I, was, I was not a good candidate for the longer board games. Um, I had to pick things that were fast, so I could do, you know, Parcheesi and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But, um, Monopoly, it was, it was too, much, too much strategy, too much time. Um, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't a good girl for that. I grew up in Florida, the, um, the capital of spring break, and at the time that I grew up, it was the height of spring break. It was where everybody went. We would have 100,000 people down on the street, college students, uh, just partying their little hearts out, and I was right in the middle of that for free. So every year I got to go do that. So. Um, because I got straight A's, mm-hmm. um, and I, I seemed, I appeared to be responsible. Um, I wasn't super well as I could be, and I made a lot of trouble. And just by the, you know, the luck of God, I, I, I just didn't get caught. I'm looking at the chat room. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently there are strategies in Monopoly. Uh, Michelle's saying that if you land in jail, stay there and let everyone spend their money. Or if there are a lot of hotels, stay in jail to keep them to keep yourself from landing on them. So I, I didn't realize that there's actually a strategy in 
Monopoly. But, you know, there are some good things about Monopoly, and I say that with a kind of a, you know, sheepish question-like attitude. It teaches our children how to count money in this third-dimensional reality while saving for something that you deem important. But basically what, what Monopoly teaches us, though, is greed, divide and conquer, materialism, and how to worship the almighty dollar while bankrupting your friends. I mean, it is, and, and there has to be – I know I personally at that stage probably wasn't as mature as I could be playing Monopoly. So when somebody landed on my place at the hotel, I couldn't have been more of a poor sport and 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 just laughed like crazy, and, and I was happy for their loss. Yeah, <laughs> so. and, and I'll tell you, it's the ultimate gangster game, and it's, it's probably the most money-making game that people have bought throughout the years. Go figure. You know, but I mean, it, it is. Um, I mean, it, it is some. It is some fun. I mean, if you can get if you can get a full board playing with four people, and you have houses and hotels everywhere. I mean, it does get kind of exciting. I I tended to um, play cards more. I was a mm-hmm. card person. I like to play, you know, poker, crazy eight, you know, um, things like that. I had some fun with that. Let me ask you this. Are there any games that you can think of that, that you played when you were a kid that were actually productive or taught you something beneficial? I, you know, I'm not sure of that. Maybe operation. So I learned, you know, how to take parts out of people in case I was going to become a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> like I did it carefully not to get buzzed. <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. know. How about you? Well, we used to build tree forts, teepees, and lean tos and sometimes we would go hiking to a place called Big Rock and uh, spend the day there. My, my parents took us camping every summer to the Jersey Shore, so that was fun as well. I also went fishing and played every sports, every sport game that was thrown in front of me, and I started to learn guitar at an early age. So I, there, there was other things to keep me occupied other than, you know, s- silly board games, but. I'll tell you now that I, I really see behind Monopoly, it's kind of like it's kind of like sports. I like to play them. I like I like going out and shooting hoops, but I'm not going to watch them. So it, I understand the the concept behind Monopoly, but now that I know what I know, it kind of really turns me off about playing it. Well, you know, I think a lot. I mean, what I think is nice about board games is it's a nice chance for people to get together and families to get together to do something that's not watching TV. It's not, you know, it's, it's not playing video games. You're actually sitting there with no electronics and you're being together as a family. So I definitely think there, you know, there are some games that are really fun. I think one of the fun ones, I know that my daughter and her friends like to play are the ones where, you know, you get the card and you have to act something out and somebody has to guess what, you know, what you are, what you're doing. They seem to love that one. And uh, so I, I like games like that. I think those are more fun and they're, you know, they're very harmless and they're, they laugh a lot. And, you know, those are great. Like I said, there's what's, what is nice about these, you know, physical games is that they take people away from electronic things. There's no cell phones then. There's no TVs. There's no radio. You're just sitting there and you're being together, mm-hmm. you know. So I think they, they definitely have their purpose. Now, to those people listening right now, if you have kids, here's a great game that you can play with them. And I've done this with my daughter and uh, a friend of mine and her daughters. What you do is you get together five separate different items. It could be a quarter, a guitar pick, uh, who knows, whatever, five different items. Uh, And each person has the same five items in front of them. And what you do is you sit in a circle, but your backs are facing the circle. Then you take turns with one person picking up one of the items and trying to telepathically send the message to everybody else of what they're thinking about. So, for example, if I were to pick up a quarter, maybe I I, I would think about a slot machine spitting out a bunch of quarters or a roll of quarters or something like that. And eventually everybody will try to read what your mind is trying to send out to everyone, and uh, you all hold your hand out at the same time and then flip it over. And uh, it's really interesting. My daughter and I have done this numerous times. And, uh, well, one out of five, the odds of that happening is 20%. But her and I hit between 65 and 70% on telepathy. So uh, it's a really great way to spend 
quality time with your kids and to teach them something beneficial. Oh, no, totally. No, I, that, that sounds like fun, and that, that's kind of something similar to what, um, I, what I play with my daughter when I'm kind of bored. I play that with her and her friends when I want to be the entertainment of them, mm-hmm. um, is that I make them think of a color, and then I guess the color. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to say I, nine out of ten times I guess it. And they're so freaked out that I think that's part of my enjoyment is that's just one of my psychic gifts is that, you know, I can, I, I do mind reading pretty well. <laughs> and so they're all freaked out. And, you know, mm-hmm. and of course they're all like, Oh my God, Oh my God. You know? And I'm just like, awesome. Awesome. Got another one, you know, mm-hmm. because it, you know, they maybe they're thinking uh, yellow and then I'll see Pikachu and I'll say, I see Pikachu. It's yellow. And they're like, Oh my God, it was yellow. And so, um, That's one of the things I do. This is what happens when you don't have a lot of money and you have to entertain yourself. You do these dumb things. Those are the best (laughs) things, honestly, I think. You know, it's it's every uh, Christmas and birthday and whatever holiday, I always ask my daughter to make me a card instead of buying me one because it comes from her heart. It's created with her energy and her love, and there's nothing better than a homemade card. Oh, I, I agree com- with you completely. I've, I've saved. Um, I'm not a hoarder by any means, but I definitely, each, each of my children has a box of, you know, stuff that has some of their baby clothes and, um, you know, the little socks and some favorite outfits and pajamas and mm-hmm. drawings and stuff like that. And, and, of course, when we had these fires here a couple of weeks ago, you know, those were the first things I had to pack because, you know, God forbid something happened to that stuff, you know. So that that's kind of the precious thing because my, my stuff got destroyed because my mother did not take very good care of this stuff. And, yeah, I know. And so I felt kind of sad that I didn't have anything to show my children. And so now my son, I'm like, do you want to save these pajamas here, these like Ninja Turtle ones? And he's like, yeah, would not be cool if, you know, if I have a son, he can wear those pajamas. And I'm like, exactly, exactly. I'd like to remind everyone that our phone lines are open, so feel free to call us at 646-716-8890. And we're going to move on to number four, and that is divide and conquer techniques. So we were just talking about divide and conquer through the games our children play, and this could be referenced in almost every topic we're talking about tonight, including religion, healthcare, and education. But the main way our kids are being brainwashed through divide and conquer techniques is through sports. While sports provide exercise and promote physical dexterity and good health, they also play into the divide and conquer mentality that our children will carry with them for the rest of their lives. So Sherry, I know that you were talking earlier about how you were in um, your, what was it, the Episcopal school and you played sports there. What kind of sports sports did you play when you were growing up? Well, I was a little tomboy, so um, and they didn't have separate girls' teams, so I ended up playing on all the guys' teams. I played on the guys' soccer team, the guys' baseball team, the guys' basketball team, and the guys' track team, because they're really just, um, it was a very small school, and the girls just, you know, on the whole weren't super interested in sports, mm-hmm. and they, they didn't, and the other, they played against other church schools, and, you know, the same thing is that the girls didn't have a, a huge interest in sports at that time and they weren't really pushed into them like they 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 are now Mm. you know it's it's much more equalized but you know back then you know when I was in you know younger in in, you know middle school it was they only had it so I was the only girl on the the soccer team so I was the only one that was allowed to block my boobs so if the ball was going to come and hit me Mm -hmm. I was allowed to put my hands up and everyone said, that's not fair, that's not fair. But that was the rule, is that if you were a girl, you were allowed to block yourself, whereas if you were a guy, you were allowed to get hit anywhere. Nobody cared. <laughs> so it was, kind of a, it was kind of a funny thing that, that I got a kick. I see that. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Up, TMI, right? TMI. Make it up <laughs> rules for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I see that uh, we're going to bring Michelle back on here, and she's going to uh, talk to us a little about the future um, school topic. So, Michelle, are you there? Hey, guys. 
Hi. 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 Yay. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, Sherry. Well, you know, we were talk we were talking about school earlier, and I just had a thought. You know, really, what we can do is when we change our our school system. You know, when we're able to create um, a better life in a 5D reality, um, wouldn't it be great if uh, instead of, you know, the traditional things that our, our kids go to school for, wouldn't wouldn't it be great if we had exciting subjects like cosmic science where they identify the placement of universes in our cosmos and the difference between like free-willed universes and non-free-willed universes and like universal science, how planets, moons, and stars are sentient beings and how they all work together, and um, creation science, the study of how everyone and everything is connected from one creator and how we can contribute to that creation. I mean, you know, these kind of things, this, this deep programming starts, you know, at home with um, with people waking up and if, you're, if your children are, are young, this is something that, you know, you could talk to them about, whether it be through your form of religion or your beliefs, but as long as it, you know, involves the fact that, you know, our child, our, you know, we have a spark of our creator within us. And when, um, when we discuss things like that with our kids and we start opening their, their mind to, like, if, if their grandfather or, or grandmother were to die and, and, you know, they're confused about where, where souls go when they die, well... You know, you can tell them. Um, you can tell them where souls go when they die. They go right to the next dimension, right next to them. And you know, if they if they were to want to talk to them, if they miss them, they can connect with them. And these are the kinds of things that we can start teaching our children. And especially if they're young, you can you can make it into a story. You know, you can story tell to them. And you know. Um, that'll that'll help a lot of the deprogramming and and you know just turn the television off. But some other um, some other future studies could be like um, you know for for high school kids, you know maybe even middle school would be like astrology, learning how to read and fully understand your birth chart because that opens up doors for children to really um, step into what they came here to do. Um, Astronomy, understanding the importance of stars, planets, and constellations, and learning how the the stars can show us the cycles of time along with how they can be used for navigation. Um, Sixth sense studies. Let's say that um, our children can see spirits. Um, That usually scares them. And, um, you know, a lot of times they also begin to hearing people's, they begin to hear people's thoughts. And like, for instance, I was talking with a friend friend of mine um, with her son on on the phone today, and um, I, I I asked him a question. I said, "Well, well, what did you do today?" And he was silent, and I knew what was happening. He was actually tuning in to me and was actually um, speaking tele- <laughs> telepathically to me, and it was me that wasn't. Uh, wasn't holding up my end of the bargain by by talking back to him, but um, I knew I just innately hit me what was happening, and then I I said, um, "Are you there?" And he said, "Oh yes, I'm here. I'm I'm back." <laughs> so, you know, um, just being awake and aware and studying um, what we can do and starting to think about what if we were to be able to change our our schools? What if the school st- system did collapse along? with uh, religion, the Vatican, uh, along with our, our banking and finance, our economic system, um, how would we rebuild it? Because, you know, in order for things to, to really get better, things are going to have to collapse. Um, another thing that would be great is uh, things like uh, yoga or tai chi. Um, we could teach our children um, methods for healing instead of, you know, on TV, there's so many medical commercials from Big Pharma um, teaching our children when they get sick. You know, they're you know even the commercial for um, cough syrup. You know, they're coughing, the kids coughing, and mommy comes in to take care of the child and gives them a spoonful of cough syrup, and they're all happy. Or the old Vicks vapor rub. You know, 
Well, um, you know, it teaches the kids to, to take medications when they're sick and they grow up thinking that, and as well to go to the doctor at first signs of a cough. And mm-hmm. there are other methods, uh, natural me- healing methods available that, um, you know, I I know a lady who um, I, ta- I interviewed her on, on Larry's show with Larry, and she, ever, she and her son, who's uh, 18 years old now, have never been to the doctor. She only she had one. She had a near death experience when she had her son, and um, she's never. They've never been in 18 years to the doctor. So there are ways to get around um, the programming that you know have been taught to our children. Well, definitely. You know, a lot of people don't listen to their bodies. And the example, the prime example I use a lot is heartburn. When you get heartburn, what they're telling you on TV is to take Prilosec or Rolaids or Tums or something like that. But what your body is telling you is that you need to boost your alkaline or that it might be something more serious as Kendra wrote in in her article on the daily spiral could be a more serious um, issue that's going on. But, you know, as long as you take this pill and, you know, you're able to eat whatever it is that you want and no matter how unhealthy it is for you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, back to the school subject, um, creative arts. I mean, I know now that um, the fir- one of the first programs that gets cut in public school is the creative arts when they're, you know, running out of money. And more, more things like art and dance and drama and writing, creative writing. I mean, wouldn't it be great if our children learn how to um, automatic write, you know? Oh, <laughs> and yeah. And they started out outdoing each other in class and being able to get up and, you know, channel and read what they channeled from their higher self. Um, Other things that they, that we could change our education system to include would be community programs, you know, how to garden, how to contribute uh, economically to your community through barter system, you know, volunteering and community caregiving for all the children in the community as well. And, you know, one day when everything does collapse, I think things will will get more um, towards community living. I mean, we won't be able to, until we get, uh, you know, time travel or portals or um, <laughs> other supersonic ways like um, like Tesla trains, we won't, we, there may be a period of time where we may not be able to travel very much. And so we'll be around, um, you know, community living. Um mm-hmm. Let's see. I think spiritual psychology, learning how the body, mind, and spirit and soul interact and and how, what to think about your dreams. Um, you know, uh, Sherry, you mentioned um, a reading that you had with Andrew Bartis, and Greg had, uh, had interviewed him. Um, he was talking about um, dreams and how um, one of the things that is going to start happen, and I have seen it happen, is that the children at school will go to school and they'll, one of them will say, you know, I had a dream about uh, riding a, a red bicycle down a lane and, you know, the streetlight being blown out. And another kid will say, oh, my gosh, I had that same dream, exact same dream, red bicycle. And when I, when I rode past the streetlight, it went out. And then somebody else at the lunch table is going to hear that. And the synchronicities will become, you know, overwhelming and the kids will start um, trying to interpret what it means and they really start to come together and talk about things like that. And uh, what I've noticed lately is that a lot of the dreams in um, the circle of friends that I have are being, are are kind of the same. And we have a a friend that's actually coming to, to the drum circle on Sunday that had a dream that was similar Mm-hmm. And, I mean, the synchronicity was so close that it was like, okay, we're paying attention. Let's figure out, um, let's figure this out because there's messages and everything. So um, I didn't mean to take up too much of your time about school, but I think it's important that we start thinking about um, if if we could uh, create a school that would be fun for kids to go to and they would look forward to going to, what would it be like? Well, not just kids, but anybody. People listening right now are saying, I want to learn about that. (laughs) College. And these are just a few examples of the studies, that Greg, that you and I put on our article. 
the future of education, a school that you would want to attend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, uh, you know, check that out, everyone. It's on n5d.com. Um, you can find it on the front page or, once again, use the search button in the upper right-hand corner of the page. So what I want to attend that school. Have, Greg? Well, we're we're we still <laughs> right now. We're just moving along. We're, we're still on uh, divide and conquer right now, and uh, then and we're going to be moving on to television, education, and uh, healthcare. So we, <laughs> we have a lot, a lot more to cover <laughs> here. Okay. So that's where we're heading. Okay. Um, well, we've talked about television, and uh, we've talked about education a little bit. Um, can can I talk about healthcare for a minute, or do you have another call? Sure. Well, go, go, um, go ahead. Thank you. I wrote an article called The Future of Healthcare, and it discusses natural ways and, and uh, clinics, you know, that where healing can occur with, with natural um, healing techniques. And one of the things that you and I are, um, are working on and are interested in is this Sherry Edwards, Edwards sound healing. Mm-hmm. And um I know, you know, Atlantis um, is a myth to some people, but in the time of Atlantis, um, they had healing centers and they used sound and crystals to um, to re, um, re-energize and clear the cells in the body so that the body would not age. And, um, you know, living even living in a, in a 3D environment and polarity, you're still in polarity, they, you know, they did pick up um, energies that got stuck in the body in the aura or whatever. And I think it was something like once a year everyone would go and have this treatment. Well, I think that Sherry Edwards mentioned Atlantis in the video uh, that I think you're going to post in the article tonight. Um, mm-hmm. I think, um, yeah, basically um, the sound healing can... Um, reverberate the cells to an original DNA pattern um, of, of perfection, of healing. And so um, that is part of what they used in Atlantis. And what she's able to do, and I'm just going to say this in layman's terms, what she was able to do is hear the, um, perf- the, perf- the perfected sound pattern of a person's cells and then she was able to um, um, repeat that and and use her voice to reprogram the cells. So if you had a disease, it would um, reprogram the cells to erase that disease. And each disease also has a pattern that she, after um, a long, a whole lot of years of research, was able to um, put these patterns of these diseases in computer programming. And so there's a way that you can speak and the patterns come out of your voice and now the computer program reads these patterns and she's able to tell you what needs to be healed. Now you can do like a sample on their website and a sample, a little sample programming, and it can give you some broad guidelines. But if you've really got, you know, some major problems, you can have a session, and that's really what you and I, Greg, are going to try to be certified in, is to learn how to do these um, these serious healings to where mm-hmm. we use the software, and the the patient will will talk into the thing and into the microphone, and um, the computer will uh, give us the tones and, and we create tones and, and send it back to the people. And that's going to, that's going to be the future of our walk-in clinic, actually, the AHH clinic that we've been talking about so much. So I'm really excited about Sherry coming on the show uh, next weekend, or next Monday, sorry, and, um, and sharing more about this because she'll get into real specifics on how it works and everything. But I'm just fascinated and excited to, um, to start, you know, sharing this healing, this healing sound technology with everybody 
because it is so important as we as we are raising our vibration to uh, vibrate apart those energies that uh, that uh, are stuck within our bodies from either past lives or you know different things, and we need that for our children too. Um, you know, we can reverse all vac- all vaccine um, issues that have happened with children, like um, autism, and like Sherry mentioned, you know, our, our Sherry, like she mentioned. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting next week to hear Sherry and Sherry talk. You're going to have to <laughs> put new names with them. <laughs> but it's it's a very exciting thing, and so the future of, of health care for our children, is, you know, hopefully can involve healing modalities such as sound technology, um, massage therapy, um, acupuncture, um, quantum healing touch, things like this, rather than just rushing them to the, to the doctor to get, you know, big pharma to write a prescription. So um, I appreciate you letting me talk about that, Greg. And Sherry, it's, it's so good to hear your laughter and, your your fun stories and um carry on (laughs) thanks uh thanks so much michelle and i i I can't say enough about how excited i am to hear and to have sherry edwards on as our guest next week next monday on in 5d radio so we're gonna really get into that and find out a lot more about this uh sound therapy that can literally cure and heal anything so I see that we have another caller on hold. That's that would be area code five four one. You're on N five D radio with Sherry and, and Greg. Can I get your name, please? Area code five four one. Okay. I see a question mark there, but we're gonna put them on hold. And we're going to move on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Living forth. Yes. Now, I mentioned in the article, Seven Ways Our Kids Are Being Brainwashed, how many asinine arguments have you seen between two grown men arguing whose team or whose player is better than the other? Well, first of all, it's not their team unless they have physical ownership of it. And secondly, the two players they're arguing about probably couldn't care less about their argument. And lastly, these two people are too – too blind to see how they're still buying into the divide and conquer mentality that was ingrained within them since they began playing cowboys and Indians at a young age. What it all boils down to is my tribe versus your tribe. And you can literally see this in the National Football League when the Dallas Cowboys play the Washington Redskins or the Kansas City Chiefs. It's literally cowboys versus Indians. So That's true. Sherry, how are the divide and conquer techniques being played out in the corporate world? Well, I mean, I th- <laughs> to begin with, aren't aren't the biggest corporations owned by the same corporations? So mm-hmm. I don't I don't know if there's so much divide and conquer because they're they're sort of owned by they're sort of all tied in together and and owned by the same people working in a monopoly to control the world so i don't even i don't know if they necessarily have a divide and conquer well you still have you you still have the rothschilds versus the rockefellers going on there's a little battle going on there and you know they i i think they kind of uh answer to the same master, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But I mean it could be to conquer small businesses, to, you know, conquer mm-hmm. conquer the the original people that you know operated uh, that have some little operations that they're taken over by, you know, large corporations. Mm-hmm. You know, a common strategy used on business executives is to take them out golfing to see how they react to diversity. For example, if they shank a shot into the water hazard, how will they react? Are they going to get all pissed off or will they handle it gracefully? You know, so they, they, they play these little games amongst themselves too. So it's just something to throw out there. Um, we're going to move on because it's all, we're already an hour and 45 minutes into the show and we're only up to number five, which is television. <laughs> oh, yay. This is a good one, too. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is huge. Now, when we watch TVs, our, our minds go into the alpha state, and that's similar to when we meditate. This sets people up for going into a hypnotic state. How many times have you recorded a program but forgot to fast forward through the commercials? Um, I, I think most people forget to fast forward, mm-hmm. but, and they just watch it. They're, it's like a trained monkey. Definitely. You know, we've, we've, we've all done this numerous times, and there's a reason for that. When our minds get locked into this hypnotic state, it's difficult to rationally think about anything else other than what's on television. Now, the following is a brilliant explanation from a video by Max Egan called The Calling. How far can I control my mind? And perhaps the most important tool that is used to keep people in check and prevent them from ever becoming truly aware is television. Television is the greatest and most all-pervasive hypnotist and propaganda tool ever conceived. TV teaches people what to think, but not how to think. And TV has given modern humans an utterly false perception of society, of the world, and of each other. Through TV, the power elite have succeeded in creating a distracted, misinformed, divided and class-driven society suffering historical amnesia and completely oblivious to the true realities of their surroundings. And all of these people view themselves as truly informed and are very quick to berate and ridicule anyone who offers them an ultimate perspective. Subsequently, through the ideas put into their heads by TV and through a TV-driven obsession with the collecting of meaningless trinkets, fashions and possessions that the TV tells them defines who they are as people, the power elite have also managed to rob most of the common man of their wealth, their lands, their skills, their education and their history. But most importantly, it has robbed people of their ability to think critically and objectively. And that is exactly what television was designed to do and exactly why it was invented. Every television set is also specifically designed to emit alpha waves. These can be clearly seen as a series of horizontal lines that run across the screen from top to bottom at regular intervals when using a camera to film an operating TV set, but they cannot be detected by the naked eye. These regular lines are not simply a normal part of the functioning of your picture tube. They are there for a particular reason, and they travel across the screen at a predetermined and very specific pace. How often have you seen someone sit at a TV and say, I don't like this program, and yet they sit there and watch it anyway. How often have you done it yourself? It is because of these horizontal lines are there to generate these hypnotic alpha waves. Alpha waves place you into a trance-like state as you are told what to think by scripted news readers. And told what to buy, what to wear, where to go, and always kept otherwise distracted by sport, meaningless celebrity gossip, and a barrage of sex and entertainment nowadays ever more frequently punctuated by messages of fear and warnings of imminent terror. These alpha waves produced by your TV set affect your electrical field even if you are not watching it. The TV merely has to be on. They become addictive as your body becomes used to the energy field and many people would simply feel unable to cope without the daily fix of their favourite TV show. Then this hypnotic state carries on throughout the day as people work robot-like at their given tasks usually discussing whatever the television taught them with their co-workers. Often people think they are discussing their own thoughts, but when the conversation is really analysed, it's usually not. It's about what show they watched last night, or sport, or something they learned from the Discovery Channel, their feelings towards the opposite sex, or perhaps something like the war on terror. And whether they realise it or not, what they are talking about and 98% of what they think they know about anything at all has been taught to them by the television or by print media that is wholly owned and controlled by the very same six people who own all the TV stations. That's right, six people. 60 years ago, the media in the Western world was run by 86 small corporations who all competed to deliver the best and most informative news. Today, It is run as a well-oiled, very streamlined and tightly controlled machine by just six who now control all major Western mainstream television and print media. And with the current rate of corporate growth, that number is set to soon drop to three. This has set an extremely dangerous precedent as it means that all televised and mainstream print media is now controlled by very, very few people. 
For a better and more informed perspective, obtain your news online from one of the many emerging independent websites and go to many sites from different countries and sources to compare the same story from a variety of perspectives. You can actually check out the whole clip on uh, YouTube. That's Max Egan, and it's called The Calling. So, Sherry, what were some of your favorite TV shows when you were a kid? You know, I have to say that it's probably one of the favorite shows of kids even now, and that was Scooby-Doo. Mm-hmm. Scooby-Doo. I loved Scooby-Doo, and I was also a Trekkie. Oh, I like that, too. <laughs> so, I, you know, even as a kid, I was always interested still, Joel, and metaphysical and supernatural kind of things. Those and, were probably my favorite. And sci-fi. Remember Lost in Space? Oh, I do. I do. I, rem- I do remember that. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed that one, too. Um, it, despite how cheesy all of the special effects were in that, that, that program. <laughs> But, yeah, I, I, I liked a lot of that stuff. I, you know, and back then, God, I'm really dating myself now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cartoons were only something that you would see on Saturday. They didn't have cartoons every day of the week. So, no. uh, yeah, times have changed. I know, and what's weird now is now they don't have Saturday morning cartoons anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, which is weird. Yeah. I mean, now, of course, they have the Cartoon Network, so you can watch, you know, um, honestly, I – Sometimes I was really happy for that when my kids were little and they were sick. Um, you know, you could have something on the Cartoon Network at 3 o'clock in the morning if they were up sick. That would make them feel a little bit happier to be able to watch that if you didn't have a, you know, a DVD player or something like that. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I think that's one reason why there really aren't Saturday morning cartoons anymore is there because there's, you know, the Disney Channel, there's mm-hmm. Cartoon Network and, you know, different things like that. Mm. But I, find, I kind of miss that because that was always really fun. That was something I really looked forward to. Yeah, the uh, Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Hour was one of them, and I think HR Puff and Stuff and Wacky Races. And I know a lot of the younger people listening are saying, what the hell is that? (laughs) (laughs) No, I remember that HR Puff and Stuff. That was was a pretty trippy show, wasn't it? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just thinking about it saying, gosh, that, you know, it's, it, it just like, it seemed to me that like if somebody was doing LSD and watching that show that they would be really tripped out Mm -hmm. because that was really, you know, I go back and sometimes look at it now on YouTube and I'm like, wow, that was like one of the freakiest things I ever saw. You know, and our kids will be saying the same thing about SpongeBob. (laughs) You know, SpongeBob, my kid is just, he does the worst thing. He does, he watches something on YouTube, and it's called YouTube Poop. And so what it basically is is it's SpongeBob that's words. Oh, my God. So, <laughs> it's awful. It's awful. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, kids have different senses of humor. So, so he watches these dubbed um, SpongeBob you know, YouTube poop. So where SpongeBob isn't exactly saying what he's supposed to, it might be a bad word or something else. And mm-hmm. and he's laughing his head off hysterical. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is, this is not a good thing. This is not a good thing. So most of the time I go and I just, I don't give him an option. I just shut it off. One thing I put out there for people who do watch a lot of television is eventually you're going to do a life review and in this life review, do you really want to see yourself spending your whole life watching TV and When you're not watching TV, you're working as an economic slave for some corporate bastard who doesn't give a rat's ass about you. You know, think about that. Now, are there any commercials that you can think of that you actually enjoyed? Oh, gosh, you know what? There was was one vaguely I remember. I I can't remember exactly what it was about, but I remember it really caught my eye. I think it was a a Volkswagen commercial or it was an Audi commercial. And I can't remember at the exact moment why I liked it so much. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't know. There's, there's a few commercial. I I know which one I liked. I think I liked uh, this commercial where they were at a meeting and the guy was daydreaming. (laughs) I think they called on him and he yelled something out. Oh my gosh. And I can't remember if it was like a Taco Bell commercial or it was something crazy, but I Mm -hmm. thought, oh, that's me. That was me because I'm always the one that's daydreaming sitting there, you know, while everybody's talking and they're like, Sherry, what do you think about this? And I'm just like, but a a butterfly, (laughs) you mean the butterfly that flew by? (laughs) 
you know, and so I was always, uh, that was a terrible thing when I was in school, even when I was in college, and they would call on me, and all of a sudden, I was just like, I was everywhere, but listening to what they were saying. Yeah, me too. so I'd have to make stuff up and then they'd know that I was making it up <laughs> <laughs> and it was terrible in law school because they, they get really evil too. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes they'll throw you out of the room. If you answer, like if they clearly, you didn't do your homework and, and this, you could be, I thought I think I was 27 years old or something. And they're like, clearly you didn't do the homework and reading of last night. Get out of my room. And I'm just like, okay, you know, and so it was really very embarrassing. And so there were some teachers in law school that were just, and this is, you know, this is a regular large school, you know, they would throw you out. Wow. And it was terrible because I was a chronic daydreamer. So Mm -hmm. even when, even when I had read, I still was in the middle of looking out the window. I can so so relate to that. (laughs) You know, so many times in grade school and junior high, I'd be doing the same thing. They're teaching me this state-sponsored propaganda, and my higher self is telling me, don't listen. Look out the window. That's, you're going to learn more looking out the window than you will listening to this clown. Oh, yeah, and I, and I totally believe that, that you, know, as, as, you know, as Michelle said also, is that, you know, part of, you know, what this lack of attention that children have is because they're, they're in a concrete building. Mm-hmm. They have a window to look out and see beautiful nature. And when they are allowed to get out, they're put on a concrete playground. Mm-hmm. So they they might not even have any contact with the earth that entire day. They might just go from the building onto more concrete. And then, you know, they give them a lunch that, you know, is mainly just carbs and GMOs and, mm-hmm. and then send them back in at, at, at my son's school that he's assigned to. You know, they also, they equalize them with wearing uniforms because it's a, you know, economically disadvantaged um, school in an area. And so they make them wear uniforms so they they all look alike too. And so it's just, I I, I always felt kind of bad because the the kids couldn't really show their individuality. Mm -hmm. Now, one of my favorite commercials when I was, uh, I think this came out maybe uh, 10, 15 years ago. I'm just going to play the clip and see if you remember it. Mr. Dumbass. I can bring a lot to dumbass and dumbass. I'm a go-getter. Dumbass material all the way. So, am I your man, Mr. Dumbass? The name is Dumas. That's pretty thick-headed. But nothing compared to the rich, thick, frosty mug taste of an A&W root beer. With A&W, it's good to be thick-headed. What a dumbass. Do you remember that commercial? Were they allowed to say that? Well, his name was Dumas, and so they got away with saying dumb ass instead of with a B, just D-U-M-A-S. Oh, I'm surprised. Yeah. So I remember a few years ago there was a Budweiser commercial about a man who raised a Clydesdale pony only to give him away to be one of the Anheuser-Busch horses. So he was at this parade, and they noticed one another, and by the end of the commercial they reunited. Now, this is a very touching commercial, but what is it really selling us? Well, basically, the thought process is, I love that commercial. I love that horse. I love Budweiser. Yeah, no, they they, they really do have a, you know, they, they that's one of my complaints is that, you know, in very, very basic things, even that they somehow manage to stick sex into things that are so, so inappropriate that make no sense for it even to be there. And it's so obvious, I think, God, these advertisers are so stupid. And then I think, well, maybe they just think that everybody's stupid that can't figure this out because, you know, um, one of the biggest gripes that I have that I just, I'm, I'm stunned by this is that Julia Roberts movie, Pretty Woman, where she's mm-hmm. a prostitute, mm-hmm. this plays continually on the family channel. Really? Continually. And Mm -hmm. I say, I like, in what world are they thinking that it's okay to have a story of a prostitute with a heart of gold that gets a man who has to pay for it 
And but then they fall in love. So isn't that wonderful? And I'm like, why is this on the family channel? Is this like, is this like to tell little girls that you know, like if you're a great you know hooker, then you have a chance to meet a really neat rich guy and live happily ever after. And so I'm stunned, quite frankly, whenever this comes on the family channel. Of of I think it's so, and I'm very open sexually, but. I find that to be just disgusting. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just, I'm stunned at that. I agree that, with you. That to me is too much. Yeah, that's that's really overstepping the boundaries right there. I mean, sure, I can understand if it's on some other channel that plays risque kind of things late at night, but on the Family Channel, of course, that I believe is owned by ABC. I'm not sure. Well, you know, maybe they're they're getting money each time it, it plays, but you know, still, I just I find it very shocking, and it's like. I don't know. It seems randomly like half the time I turn on the family channel, it's playing. And I'm like, wow, this is really, they're really pushing prostitution here. Mm-hmm. And and I just, I don't, and, and it, they'll play it during the day. They'll play it on Sunday nights. Who wants to watch Pretty Woman on Sunday night with your family? What kind exactly. of family? What kind of family fair is that? It's so strange. Sherry, I see we have another caller here from the 267 area code. Can I get your name, please? It's Andrew. Remember me? (laughs) (laughs) I had a feeling that was you, buddy. How are you doing tonight, Andrew? Energized. I missed some of your show because I was out sun gazing, but I'll make sure I listen to that part when you upload it to YouTube. Awesome. Yay. Hi, Andrew. Great. First time talking to you on the radio, Sherry, right? Uh, you know, it is. Yeah. First time. Pleased to meet you. Talk to Heidi. Talk to Kendra. First time talking to you. Probably won't mm-hmm. be the last. Well, hopefully it'll be an amazing experience for you that you will never forget in your life. <laughs> That's right. I don't think I'll ever forget it. I'll make sure I listen to, <laughs> to every show because you raise the vibrations of of consciousness. But I um, did want to give my comment on the subject matter, seven ways our children are being brainwashed. I actually became very familiar with this subject in my junior year, junior year of high school when I did a report on school locker searches, became very familiar with the uh, way the courts have ruled, and they are obviously not on the side of the kids. What's really disturbing is the courts throughout um, the past several decades have basically followed the mentality of People under age 18 have fewer rights than people over the age of 18. There's no specific reason why that's just the way it is. Therefore, schools can violate kids' rights whenever they want, no warrants necessary, and all the rest of it. Well, it shouldn't be a, take a rocket scientist to figure out that taking away the rights of kids is a stepping stone to taking away the rights of everybody, you know, fear mongering intended, but that's reality. So I think we got to make sure we fight for kids' rights. And when I had a Rule of Law radio show host, Eddie Craig, on my show, he made it very clear. The creator created all of us. The creator is the only entity that can grant rights. Kids have the same rights as adults, but sometimes because of the development of a kid, the parents do have some leeway in violating rights to make sure the kid can develop to manage in society. But well, that's the gist of it. So make sure your kids don't get their rights violated. Hey, Andrew, um, right, uh, while you brought it up, why don't you tell the listeners about uh, where they can find you and a little about your show? Well, thanks for being so generous to give me the time to do this. Um, Nature of Reality Radio on Plot Talk Radio. Um, that's what it's called, Nature of Reality Radio. Um, unfortunately, my guest, who's supposed to be InfoWars reporter, Dan Badandi, who became famous for shutting down three press conferences after the Boston bombing for asking tough questions. He hasn't gotten back to me, so I'm thinking maybe just maybe Michelle Walling will be a substitute guest tomorrow, but hey, I still want to give Dan the chance, so um, I'll see what happens. That'd be awesome. To, yeah. Yeah, air tomorrow, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern. That's the normal air time, but I do. I am kind of flexible with the time, so it's not always 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. Now, for those uh, listening, Andrew has been a pretty much a regular caller on N5D Radio, and I couldn't tell you how many times I have told him, you need to get a radio show. <laughs> and he finally did, and I've been posting your videos on N5D News. Yes, and by the way, I miss you on Facebook. Account got temporarily blocked about two weeks ago, sent in an ID like they requested to validate, validate my date of birth, but they haven't activated my account for some inexplicable reason, and the nature of reality radio Facebook page is no more temporarily. Well, hopefully temporarily. Mm-hmm. You don't know what the Facebook Nazis, they could be lying, but, hey, I miss you guys on Facebook. 
hopefully you get that resolved and uh, everything gets back to the way it should be. I saw that you put a message out there uh, explaining that on Facebook. So, uh, yeah, and, and you've done everything you can do. You followed their rules and have gone through the whole process, and uh, they're still holding you up. So hopefully they get you back on. I hope so, too. you got to get into the Matrix to beat the Matrix, and Facebook is a good way to do that. Damn right, brother. <laughs> yes. All right, that's about it. Why don't you finish up the list? Are you, like, you're on number six, right? And the seven uh, we're working our way down right now. <laughs> we're, going on, we're moving on to number six um, right after this. All right. Take so we're care, We're going to wrap it up. And, all right. Take care, Andrew. Take Bye. Care. Bye. So by allowing the mainstream media to influence our thoughts and perceptions, we're creating irrational thought processes based on completely fictitious ideas, premises, and images. And this, this is why you'll never feel good after watching the, the nightly news, which is mainly fear-based propaganda designed to keep you living in lower vibrational thought patterns. And even if you don't watch the news, but still watch your favorite TV programs, the television commercials are equally as bad. And this is why we never see an introverted person on TV ads because it shows the wrong message to those in power as they discourage people from looking within. Every ad shows some extrovert with his or her group of friends living the fictitious life that you should be living through their eyes. And these people have above average looks and portray success, which subconsciously tells us that we're not good enough the way we are. And if we want to be successful, beautiful, and have friends like them, then we need to purchase whatever product they're selling. Now, these commercials are also telling you that you're not good enough the way you are while reinforcing the overactive mind to understand the differences that never truly existed. And as I step down from my soapbox. <laughs> no, I mean, I agree. I'm, I agree with you. You've just depressed me thoroughly. <laughs> I'm like, God, I have no reason to even turn it on at this point. He's just depressed me. No, but it's true. I mean, it, there, I mean, you know, occasionally there is some interesting things on, and, you know, of course we love ancient aliens, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I like The Deadliest Warrior. I thought that was a cool series. And, you know, there's some, there's some interesting stuff, but, but on the whole you're right. You really can't escape it to get somewhere nice. I mean, mm -hmm. some cable shows are, you know, there's some awesome cable channels, but, you know, then, then again, you know, you have, I love, the you know Bravo Network because they have some of the great creative shows of mm -hmm. you know people creating great dishes which I like I like to watch the creative shows people you know creating great dishes creating great fashion um, I I love Face Off it's the um, it's on the Sci Fi Channel where they do movie makeup and creatures and I love to watch these people being creative so for me. That's okay. I say I'm okay with that. I'm okay with this show. Okay. Well, you watch a lot more TV than I do. I actually the only time I turn on the TV, I have I paid extra for dog TV, and I let let my German Shepherd watch that if I go to the beach for an hour or two. I put that on for him. <laughs> are you kidding? Are you? I am serious. <laughs> Why? It's really for dogs. Are you serious? Yes. He'll sit there and he'll actually watch the dogs on TV. What is it, like girl dogs or something? All sorts what of dogs. It? Yeah, all sorts of dogs just going around. They're in a dog park. They're at the beach. They're doing whatever their dogs do. And no commercials, just 24 hours of dogs. <laughs> so you're, you're kidding. And this is for, for your pet to watch? Yes, yes. And I do watch, I do watch football. I am uh, an avid football fan. So, And I do understand the, the whole divide and conquer premises behind that. But I... I play in a couple fantasy football leagues, and it's a great way to bond with the guys. So, you know, as long as you understand the premise behind that and you don't overly obsess over it, everything in moderation is the bottom line. Now, we're going to move on to uh, number six, and that's education. So what do our kids really learn through public education? The educational system encourages conformity and competition while suppressing or ignoring any special abilities a child may have such as the ability to have an out-of-body experience or any other psychic ability. Now, there's this woman, Karen Lamoureux, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, and there was a viral video about her, and she spoke to the Arkansas Board of Education where she posed the question, are you smarter than a Common Core fourth grader? The question was, 
Mr. Yamada's class has 18 students. If the class counts around by a number and ends with 90, what number did they count by? And does anybody on the board have an answer? So one board member said five. So she asked the board member, how did you come up with that answer? And the board member said, I divided 90 by 18. So Lamoureux said, do you know why? Because that, that makes sense, right? That's the way we were taught to do it. Lemro then held up a piece of paper with some kind of elaborate number sequence of pictures, adding, if the student answered the question the way the board member did, it would have been marked wrong. The children were expected to draw 18 circles with 90 hash marks, solving the problem with exactly 108 steps. Now, this woman, uh, Karen Lamoro, was interviewed by Glenn Beck, and this is what she had to say. My son, in order to do his fourth grade math homework in a state of absolute tears and frustration, felt that he had to empty a box of Kraft macaroni and cheese and use raw macaroni noodles to complete a fourth grade math assignment that could have been done using two steps standard algorithm. And the proponents of Common Core, and even when I talk to a lot of my local legislators or people at the state education level, will brag about how they have teachers in their camp that love Common Core and they think it's great and they say that they have teacher support. But since I've taken this on uh, and spoken with coalitions all over the country, and there are so many, uh, teachers are writing me from all over the country, not just my own state, saying, please help us. We can't, I can't post anything on your Facebook page. I can't speak out about this because I have been threatened with insubordination. This is crazy. We need parents to take this up and fight this for us because we don't have a voice. It's obvious that there's a dumbing down of society while at the same time our educational system is training our kids to become good little economic slaves for a corrupt system without having the chance to question why they're doing what they, they do. So this activist is giving them the voice that they need as well as for the teachers who are afraid to speak out about this subject and most likely would lose their jobs. So Sherry, what's your opinion on Common Core? I, you know, I, I'm going to say intuitively, I feel like uh, a lot uh, states additionally are going to refuse to go along with it mm -hmm. because it does. I, I know at my son's school, um, you know, the principal and all the teachers, they grimace when they even talk about it because they hate it. And they, you know, they just say when I, you know, he was behind in math, they go, oh, well, it doesn't matter because we're all learning it new. Everyone's mm -hmm. learning it new. And I'm like, what's new about math? Math has been math since math was created. <laughs> it hasn't really changed, you know? Mm -hmm. Geometry has been, you know, geometry for, you know, millions of years. And so they don't like it at all. And I just, I think it's a matter of, you know, it's, it's like the state saying, look, we approve, we're going to, even though federal says no, we're going to approve marijuana laws because we have the right to. I think that states are going to do the same thing with this Common Core because a lot of them really don't like it, and they they think it's ridiculous. And it, it might be a it might not do as well if when the presidency changes. Mm -hmm. It might be a you know with, with a different crew coming in, it could it could have this stopped. Mm. So do do you think that there's a better way to teach our children? Well, I mean, I you know, I homeschooled um, my child, my son, for a few years because I kind of gave up on the system because I didn't want to drug him. And at that point, he really, it was impossible for him to sit through school without being disruptive and, you know, and just, just, he just, he would not behave and he would not listen. And he sat there and looked around all day, daydream like me. Um, and so I, I, and they were, you know, of of all strange things, gosh, I shouldn't even say it's personal, but um, I ended up taking him out of school, and I decided that I was going to put him in a homeschooled charter school. I said, okay, I'm going to try to homeschool him. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was really difficult, quite frankly. It takes an enormous amount of patience 
and creativity to homeschool your child. And as well, I worked from home, so it was a disaster. Mm. <laughs> I have to say, being an, only, being an only parent, it was a disaster. I, I couldn't both try to do my work and homeschool him at the same time, mm-hmm. you know, and, and try to be the only provider. It was just, it was a mess. And so I, you know, it, if if I had a partner in this, it definitely would have been a different story, and I probably would have stayed with it. But um, I, I think that some people have the luxury of homeschooling, but a lot don't. A lot of there's a whole lot of single parents, and you know, homeschooling could be a great option because then you're able to teach your child what you want them to know and what you think is important mm-hmm. and what you value. But the fact of the matter is, is they're going to be home. So unless you you know you can work from home, you know you don't have a lot of choice. And, you know, like my, my always, my claim was if, if 10% of boys are diagnosed, you know, ADHD, then they should have a separate classroom for them and a separate way to teach them rather than just say, okay, we want your kid either to take drugs or you can homeschool them. And that was basically my option. You either, you know, give your kids these drugs so he listens or you can homeschool him, but we're not going to deal with this anymore. And I was kind of like, Oh, okay, I don't see that I have any choice here. Mm-hmm. And so um, I was really, I was disappointed with the whole school system with that. And then when I put him back, thank God, you know, he had matured a little bit and he was able to patrol himself better. Um, but um, it, was, it was so regimented for him after being homeschooled. And, uh, and, and he definitely wasn't learning things. You know, he went through uh, family I think they call it family life in, in fifth grade where they teach them family life issues. Mm-hmm. And I think he didn't actually learn where parts went until the fifth day. They just scared the heck out of them talking about sexually transmitted diseases mm-hmm. before they even talked about love or anything else. You know, a, <laughs> a lot of these uh, <clears throat> homeschool programs, you're still required to cover the, the, the core issues, which is still state-sponsored propaganda, but at least you have the luxury of teaching, number one, either at your home or, you know, at, at, in nature, outside, wherever, and number two, you know, dictating the time and when you actually are going to teach your child. Um, now, if it were up to me, I, I, I love the idea that Michelle and I uh, wrote about in the article uh, the future of education, a school you would want to attend. That's the school of the future. But for right now, you know, really the only choices are either homeschool or some kind of Montessori school setting, uh, which is what our guest last week, astrologer Jim Delacoli, has his children in. Now, you know, another thing is our children are not learning the true history of our origin while being forced to learn all this propaganda of what history looks like, at least through biased eyes. Now, there's, there's an article on N5D.com called 20 History Questions They Refuse to Answer in School, where I propose 20 questions that our public educational system refuses to address. And one example is in Illinois, there was a well bit that was brought up. This well bit brought up a 200,000-year-old bronze coin from the depth of 114 feet and according to the Illinois State Geological Survey, the deposits containing the coin were between 200,000 to 400,000 years old. So the question is, long before our state-sponsored recorded history will admit that civilized man was on Earth, what culture made this coin? And that leads to another question. Is it possible that this template of economic subservience has been used since the earliest incarnations came to this planet, perhaps billions of years ago. Well, I mean, that's, that's basically it, is, is if they start telling the truth about something, then it's going to open the whole box of worms to have to tell about everything. And so, mm-hmm. exactly. you know, so, so they can't. They really can't change the history without starting to tell the real history and at the same time you're you know you're saying well i wish they would teach this history in school Mm -hmm. but but you're talking about that most of these kids parents are still asleep so they Mm -hmm. believe the history themselves so you have to have you know shows like your show and other people's shows and and you know groups 
and different people so that the parents, the adults are learning so that they that so that they understand that what their children are learning is BS. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know what I mean? The parents yeah. have to believe it first. I, I I agree. You know, you know, keep drinking the fluoridated water and everything will be okay, right? Right. And the teachers have to believe it, too. I mean, because if you have a teacher that is even somewhat awakened, they'll modify stuff. They they will because they're in charge of that classroom Mm -hmm. and they will modify things even a little bit. And, you know, they may say they may push, um, you know, maybe they may push um, bottled water or maybe they may say very quietly, remember not to swallow too much toothpaste when you brush your teeth. So if you have awakened teachers They'll also try to get away with what they can mm-hmm. to help the children. Yeah. You know, this really makes you think about how many times a reset button was pushed on humanity. You know, if if there was a 200,000-year-old coin found in Illinois, it also makes you think about how many times we've been economic slaves for the ruling elite. Well, I mean, that, you know <laughs> – one only wonders, right? I mean, mm-hmm. if you could answer that, you could probably answer a whole lot of other things, and <laughs> it would make this place no fun anymore. Because yeah. then wouldn't we would understand it? We would understand everything, and then the game would be over. I want the game to be over. I'm sick of. I'm a little bit tired of playing <laughs> it. I guess. I, I yeah, I'm getting annoyed of playing it too. <laughs> this is this is real life monopoly. <laughs> I just, you know, like I, um, I, I did my first um, video upload to YouTube yesterday, mm-hmm. and it was my child. He looked in the sky and he said, "Oh my God, Mom! It's a, it's a Kembo, which is a combination of, uh, you know, a chemtrail rainbow." And I looked at it and I was like, "Oh my God, this is unbelievable!" Mm-hmm. And, and I don't even know if we were the only ones that noticed it. In the, whole area, in the whole area. Yeah. And so I filmed it, and you could very, very clearly see the chemtrail lines. And you could see that this wasn't a rainbow. This was not an arch, beautiful rainbow like you see. This was a big, just a flash of square color of rainbow. It, you know, it was very, very fake and very weird. And who knows, it could have even been some type of portal opening. That's the kind of crazy world we're in is you never quite know what you're looking at. Mm-hmm. I've actually seen those too here in, in uh, Florida. As a matter of fact, I was at the drum circle a couple of weeks ago, and uh, beautiful evening, and there was a a rainbow chemtrail cloud that was over the the horizon, and people are like, "Oh, isn't that beautiful?" And I'm thinking, "Well, <laughs> beautiful is one way of saying it, I guess." <laughs> No, I know, but you know that's a um I I just I can't say how many years that I went of my life looking up at them and never noticing that it was anything. And I think that's just part of awakening is that you are not turned on to awaken until you're turned on to awaken. Because you can, you know, you can point this out to somebody and mm-hmm. they still won't see it because it's beyond their um, scope of what they're willing to believe. It's well, you, beyond their belief. You know what? And that is the perfect segue for the seventh and final way that our children are being brainwashed, and that's through health. Now, before we get into this topic, I'd like to read one of the comments on this article that's on N5D, uh, and the comments by a person named Allie. Now, this is about everything that we've talked about so far. She said, This is one of the least legitimate articles I've ever read. Vaccinations save thousands of lives and prevent millions of cases of illnesses every year. There is no legitimate link between vaccines and autism due to mercury, and a bug bug explodes when it consumes GMOs. Do you even understand science? If you want to talk about brainwashing, this article is a prime example. Research some legitimate facts before you present your opinion as truth. Now, that's just the perfect example of the typical person that actually believes everything that they read or hear by the mainstream media. So I asked, my answer to her was, I'm curious, how much do, do paid shills make per post? Everything mentioned in this article is sourceable. You should probably learn facts before dismissing anything in this article. Ironically, you say research some legitimate facts, yet you provide nothing to back up your claim. So here are your sources. I'll look forward to 
you backing up your claim with sources as well. And I gave her this whole list of sources that backs up everything that I've said in this article. You know, and, and you can put the truth out in people's faces if you want, if you want. But whether they listen or understand or awaken, you know, that, that's not up to us. It's up to them. And uh, no matter who you are in this genre, you're going to run into people like that. So just try to answer them and be as loving as possible. I know sometimes it can be frustrating. Now, um, just going into uh, a little bit deeper into health. Um, Michelle was on here. She mentioned uh, the article that, that she has on uh, called the, the Future of Healthcare, Michelle Walling. Uh, and you, you can find that on n5d.com. Now, let me ask you this, Sherry. If you knew then what you know now, would you vaccinate your, your kids? You know, I've, I've thought about this, actually. And I'm as much as I'm enlightened to all of this and as much as I read all the time, you know, that I forgot that girl who, I forgot her name, but she has a Ph.D. now. She was on TV, Blossom, okay? Oh, Blossom, really? who got the Ph.D. in like a neuropsychology or something. I said, did not I, know that. She said, I never vaccinated my children. And so I'm kind of, I'm still a worry ward. Mm -hmm. And I still would have, um, I probably, I hate to say it, but I, I probably still would have done it only because I would feel like if they did catch something that it was my fault for being a conspiracy theorist. This is what I would say, even though this doesn't, you know, this is really uncharacteristically me. I think I still am. am I still, I think I'm buying into it a bit. Yeah. For, I'll tell you what, for what I know about mercury and thimerosal, there's no way. There's no way. One, actually, some of the articles that I posted for reference, these are just some of the titles. Baby monkeys develop autism symptoms after being vaccinated. Vaccinated. Eleven reasons why flu shots are more dangerous than the flu. Courts confirm quietly MMR vaccine causes autism. And the last one is CDC knew about autism linked to mercury in vaccines. So when you have all this information out there and you're seeing that there is a correlation between vaccines and autism, we're lucky our kids didn't, didn't end up autistic. And, I, you know, I, I thank Creator and Source for that. There's well, no way. unfortunately, mine did get a bit damaged, and I know that, that it was from the vaccine. I mean, I, it wasn't anything else. Mm-hmm. And I know he did get some damage, which, you know, thank God he's coming out of. He's, you know, it's, it's finally, it's fixing itself. Yeah. But um, I know that he did get some vaccine damage. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling people, but he, he spoke, because he didn't speak from the age of, I think he got it at maybe 15 months. And he didn't speak again until he was almost four. And because of the fact that I'm telepathic and he's telepathic, that's how we communicated mm -hmm. for that many years. We communicated telepathically. It was sort of weird, but um, you know, I don't know, maybe that was to help, you know, sometimes weird things happen. And because I am a you know professional psychic medium, who knows if that wasn't some training for me so that I was able to do this one day. I don't even know, but it was weird that I managed to hone my telepathy skills from having a child who couldn't speak. And he didn't learn sign language. I simply knew what he was talking about. I could hear him thinking, and he could hear me thinking. So it was a very strange thing. I know he did get some damage. So you're saying, you know, like, would I do it again? And I'm not sure. I think I still am, you know, there, I have gotten rid of a lot of fears, but that's one of the fears I still harbor is a little bit of a fear of, well, what if I don't and something happens? It's exactly. my fault. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I feel the same way. What, now, what, what about uh, GMOs and processed foods? How often do you stay away from them? Oh, gosh, I try to stay away from them all the time. I mm -hmm. really, that's the one thing that I really say, okay, if I, this is something I can control, and I absolutely try to control it. I try to stay absolutely away from trans fats and, you know, GMOs and artificial sweeteners. And I'm really, really good about, you know, having my kids eat healthier. They, you know, they laugh because they feel deprived because I get them Fruit Loops, a box of Fruit Loops 
once every um, two months, they get one box of Fruit Loops. And they're they're like, yay, yay, finally. And I say, okay, well, that's it. Enjoy it because that's all you're going to get. They know it's going to be for two months. And um, and I feel, okay, I, I have to I, – I, I want to let them have some things, but on the whole, they – you know, I try to be really, really careful because, like, even organic stuff, mm-hmm. it, still, it still gets chemtrailed. <laughs> so they can – you can be as organic as you want. You're still going to get all the chemtrails falling on top of your organic food. Well, it's not so, just that. It, you know, the, chem, the chemtrails settle into the soil as well as uh, some of the Roundup and pesticides that perhaps maybe some of these organic places might be using. And eventually that the, the, through the soil, it eventually gets leached into the uh, food that you're eating, but probably not as much with organic as straight-out GMOs. Now, what about uh, fluoridated toothpaste or tap water? Do you, do you use either of those? Well, you know, I primarily use um, – we're, we're switching over. I, I – was using spring water bottles, but mm-hmm. and we we did recycle. But my daughter still says you're still leaving a carbon footprint. You know we need to get rid of doing that. And I know probably the plastic leaches out stuff. So I'm trying to work my way at, at the budget that I have mm-hmm. <laughs> because that's what everybody you know everybody has to deal with what you know what financial place they're at, what they can afford. Not everybody can afford to get you know, a really, really great filter. I would love to get, you know, the one that makes the alkaline water, but I I can at this time. But that ideally, you know, I I know that you have one, and that's that's where I would like to be. Ideally, if I could be anywhere, I would be at that level. Yeah, I I have a a water dispenser where I buy these five-gallon jugs of Zephyr Hills water. You can buy that in Florida. And uh, it comes in a a BPA-free container, and uh, I add ozone to the water along with thoughts and intentions and ho'opono. Um, so I, I, I do a lot when it comes to, you know, ingesting the right thing. And I also I really enjoy this. Uh, there's an organic tangerine, orange tangerine uh, juice that I buy at this one place, Earth Origins, here in Sarasota. And uh, it's it's the most delicious Orange juice, orange orange tangerine juice that you'll ever have, um, you know. And, and I stay with all organic for the most part. Occasionally, you know, you're going to go out and have some pizza, and you know damn well that, you know, there, there's they're they're not using pink Himalayan salt. That the uh, uh, tomatoes are GMO, and so on and so forth. Everything in moderation. You know, it's okay. Don't sweat it out too badly if 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 you have some pizza or some processed food here and there, or even you know, some chicken wings or whatever, you know. <laughs> chicken wings. You know, I, I have to say that uh, chicken wings, um, I, I I have become more of a, a vegetarian than ever before, but um, chicken wings used to be pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. And they can be. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't even want to think about the process. I remember as a kid asking my parents about steak. Where did this come from? And they said, we got this at the grocery store. I said, okay. <laughs> I didn't understand, though, that it actually came from a cow. And that's what I was really trying to get at. Now, if I had to butcher my own food, I buy organic beef. I'm not vegan, but I, I, I do eat meat occasionally. And um, I do buy organic uh, you know, grass-fed beef and, and chicken. And uh, if I had to actually butcher the animal, there's no way I could do it. I would be a fruitarian. Oh, oh, me too, me too. And, and my daughter at this point, I've I've convinced her to be able to eat eggs because when she became um, vegan, she lost so much weight that she got down to a size zero, mm-hmm. which wasn't a very healthy weight. Mm-hmm. And so I'm trying to pump her up a bit, you know, with protein. And um, so I've managed to get her to eat eggs, but they have to be the uh, grass. I don't know, the grain fed free range. Cage free. Yeah, range. So that's, yeah. Right. So that those those hens had a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. They were enjoying life. They gave up an egg. 
hopefully it didn't hurt too much when I gave it up. And then she's okay with eating that. And as long as you say thank you to the eggs, you know, Mm -hmm. you say thank you to the chicken for providing you the eggs, I think you're going to be okay. (laughs) And so um, that's how I have to word things with her, Mm -hmm. you know. And so I'm getting her to, to eat more because I say, look, in reality, everything's alive. You know, the plants are alive, too. Mm -hmm. The plants have consciousness. If you, you know, watch that video of the the shrimp going into the boiling water and the plant starts flipping out, Mm -hmm. watching it and getting scared for it. So you say, you know, you realize that the plants have consciousness, too. So what, you know, why is... You know, why is an ant of, of higher than the plant? If, if they both have consciousness, they both have consciousness. Mm-hmm. Um, I have an article but, on uh, about that, uh, Plants and Consciousness on N5D. Once again, use the uh, search button in the upper right-hand corner of the webpage, and you'll find it. I, I definitely agree. And, uh, you know, one thing I like doing, too, is uh, – I do uh, what's called oil pulling, and I use uh, coconut oil. It's uh, extra virgin, cold-pressed, organic coconut oil that we get at Costco. You can buy this big-ass container for like $15 or less. And uh, what you do is you swish it around in your mouth for about five minutes, and then you spit it out in the garbage. You don't want to spit it out in the drains because it will clog up your drains. But what it does is it pulls out the toxins from your gums, and not only that, but whitens your teeth at the same time. So it's like a you know double benefit from from doing that. So I recommend to, to anyone out there give it a shot. You know, I I did try that for a while, and it definitely for sure um, whitened my teeth almost mm-hmm. immediately. Yes. It's just it felt so gross. I mean, it felt kind of gross, and I remember when I spit it in the toilet, I thought that it looked kind of disgusting, but I was like, but it's giving great benefits. It does, and it, it, it's, it's an acquired taste, really. It's, it's kind of thick when it goes in your mouth, and, you know, you're just swishing around, and it, it, for five minutes, it, you know, it's not a bad thing to do. It's, it's, it's a great thing to do for five minutes. If you can take out five minutes of your day and do that, you'll find out that there's a lot of wonderful benefits and once again, there's many articles on coconut oil uh, pulling and oil pulling on N5D. Now, we've covered a wide range of topics. What can, what can we do about this so far? So right now, just number one, realize that as long as there is money, we are all economic slaves. At, one, at what point is enough money enough? You know, you look at the richest people in the world, more net worth than, what is it, 30 or 40% of the poorest people? It's, it's crazy. Oh, yeah. I, I remember reading, like, these, these top six people had, like, I think it was like 80% of the, the wealth of the world. Okay, and it, 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 it's getting out of hand, honestly, as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's just some point where money has to be transcended. We have to move beyond money and being the economic slaves that we are. And I have a video on N5D, on the N5D YouTube channel called um, Global Unity Project, what the world needs right now. And as I was mentioning before, I have a feeling that in probably the next, up until around 2023 or or so, when when Pluto exits Capricorn, we're going to see something huge happen with the Roman Catholic Church that it does get dissolved and there will be abundance for everyone. So as we transition out of money, there will be that period of time where everybody will be economically um, good to go. Number two, ask questions, a lot of them, and I can't emphasize that enough. Everything that we talk about on the show, anything that you have a question about, don't always assume that this is the way it is. Constantly ask questions, whether it is about religion, vaccines, healthcare, GMOs, fluoride, everything that we've talked about today, ask a lot of questions. That's right, and I and I think you can you know you can help awaken other people even very very gently by um, making even suggestions. I know one of the things that I do is when I see people buying diet soda, um, you know, I, I got I try to deter them from it in a nice way mm-hmm. by saying. Oh, God, you know, especially if they're a little bit overweight, say, gosh, when I was more overweight, I found that drinking diet soda actually made me even eat more sugar because it activated, like, 
it like my body said, this isn't real sugar. So I said, I found that I even gained more weight when I had diet soda. And then they're like, oh, my God, really? And then they might consider putting it back. So I try to trick people sometimes, you know, by saying, what will they maybe be open to? But um, I try to awaken people a little more gently. Mm -hmm. But you know what? There's people who are shizzle disturbers. Mm -hmm. And um, my friend... My friend Shen is one of them, who, and that's one of his jobs, and he, he does a great job at it. And there's going to be people that are going to be real loud about saying what's happening in the world that needs to change, and there's going to be people that are subtle, and, and this world needs all of them. Mm-hmm. It really does. It needs, it needs people at every level. It needs people that, that pray. It needs people that do little things, anywhere from little things to people that are picketing to people that are risking their lives, like – Every person has a part to do it because, you know, in the end, what people don't realize is, is it's, I don't uh, believe for a minute that aliens are going to come down and save us. Mm-hmm. You know, this is something that we have to kind of, you know, realize for ourselves that we need to be good to each other. We need to make, if we make enough effort, then they might come in and say, okay, you've gotten to the point where, you really want a change. You want your different thinking, you know. But at this point, I think that, you know, a, a lot of people still don't care enough that I think that they need to make some changes before any real changes are going to happen. People can't walk by their brother on the street having nothing to eat and turn the other way. It just can't happen. Well, I think you made a good point, too, that we do have these shizzle stirs, as you call them. <laughs> You know, that, that do provide polarity and duality, and they give us an opportunity to learn lessons and help us on our spiritual path. Yeah, they do. I mean, like, everybody, ha- everybody, has, everybody has a mission, and, I, just, and I, I hate to ever judge what somebody else is doing because I have no idea what they're actually doing. They could be doing stuff in their sleep. They could be the head commander of the Galactic Federation when they're sleeping. That's my job. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, maybe they're your, they're your co-captain, okay, or maybe they're the engine, ship's engineer. Uh-huh. But, um, but we don't know that they're doing that. They could appear to be completely, you know, a useless eater, as somebody might mm-hmm. refer them. And then at night, they're doing the most amazing magical things ever they could be an an archangel who who knows what they are and so i say i don't judge i don't judge what you're doing because i don't know what you're doing i can make a judgment but i'm i'm I could also be very wrong so Mm -hmm. i try to i try to withhold what i say about people the uh number three thing uh the number three way that we can we can address this issue is to think outside the box now our educational system doesn't encourage creative thinking and the majority of what our children learn is all left hemisphere thinking, which is mathematical and logic-based, instead of right hemisphere, which is artistic and creative. So by doing so, our children are essentially being trained to work either inside a cubicle or at a fast food restaurant because they never learned the tools of creativity and how to follow their life purpose versus being forced into the corporate world of ec- economic subservience until they're 65 years old. So definitely you know, think outside the box and that goes along with questioning everything, but also not only question, but be creative, not only in the answer, but the solution as well. This is right. This is right. Number four is uh, stop watching state-sponsored propaganda television. And that's pretty, pretty uh, blatant right there. You know, it's, it, it is what it is. You know, as soon as you turn off the TV, you're going to notice uh, major changes within your mind and your well-being. Uh, yeah, you know, I always loved when they were when they would uh, show like CNN. They're on location. And they're getting blown, and there's the palm tree in back of them, and they're in the middle of a rack, and huh. and then all of a sudden you see that they were actually like in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. You know, I love when that happens. I think yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> Part of the programming. Well, I mean, we, people need to see that more often. The more they can see how fake this is, mm-hmm. the more they will start noticing everything. Yeah, it's like a lot of those uh, staged actors that we see in these false flag operations going on right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's incredible how they've, you know, people have put together some great YouTube videos about 
you know, some of the crisis actors, how they have the same person from place to place. Yeah, yeah. You know, but but it's just the same people are watching it, same people are believing it. The people who need to believe it are never even getting to go to watch this on YouTube. But but I think things are really changing because people are really starting to be noisy about it. They're really starting to be noisy about GMOs and mm-hmm. And different things. They're not being quiet anymore. They're not being subservient, and they're not being good slaves. <laughs> they really are starting to improve. They yes. really are. Yeah, it's encouraging, very encouraging to see how people are starting to wake up. And I've I've been going through this for a number of years. Oh my gosh, you know, I started building my first website in 2007, and back then it was really more of a challenge to awaken people, but. Gosh, seven years later, I've I've seen a huge change in the way people are thinking and acting, and more and more people, even my parents, have have came around to uh, understand at least where um, where I'm coming from and what I actually believe in, and they're they're starting to turn things around too. Well, I mean that my uh, that's wonderful, and I remember you telling me that as you've gone along, you've been very excited about it in our friendship. You said, oh, "My dad believes this; he agreed with that," and I was like, mm-hmm. "Yay!" Because <laughs> I know this is <laughs> I know it's you know it, it, it's it's been very important to you to you know have your parents um, you know give you the respect that you you know that you really have earned because you've worked so hard to get to this point and you've made such a difference in this world and I know how important it is, you know, for them to really understand what you've done. So by them, you know, believing in you, then they understand what an accomplishment, how hard you've worked, you know? Thank you. I think the, uh, the one thing I'm most proud of is what a lot of people don't know is that I was a child and family therapist before I started doing these um, websites and I'm still a child and family therapist, but um, my parents were trying to tell me, well, why don't you uh, continue doing the website thing and being the child and family therapist? And I kept telling them, uh, I can't do that. I, I, th- there's a path I need to follow and please understand it's never been about money. And finally, I don't know, a couple of years ago, my dad finally said, you know what? I finally get it. I understand that you need to follow your path and that money isn't everything. And it, it meant a lot to me for him to understand that. You know, I'm still getting, I'm still getting there. <laughs> um, you know, my father still is very, you know, he's, he wasn't thrilled with the fact that, you know, he did sacrifice a lot. He worked extremely hard and he sacrificed a lot to put, you know, to put me through school and then I turned around and didn't use it. And, mm-hmm. um, and I, I, I do feel bad because that could have been a retirement for him and he definitely could have enjoyed it. And he did make a sacrifice. And, you know, if my dad does listen to it, dad, I love you. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, I did, but I just, I was a different person then. I wasn't awakened and I thought that what I was doing was the right thing. And I thought, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go do this. I'm supposed to make a lot of money. I'm supposed to, you know, provide for my family and I'm supposed to use my, my intelligence to reach my potential and do wonderful things. And you'd be proud of me, but I just wanted, I was happy being a mom. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I loved being with my baby. I loved, you know, taking care of my, my husband and my child. And I, I couldn't have been happier with that. I didn't know how to explain to my father that this brought me such, you know, pleasure and joy and, and it made me feel beautiful and useful. And, and I didn't know how to say, I'm sorry that you wasted your money on me. You know what I mean? Like I felt really bad, but but I guess, you know, in all, in all, to get to where I am now, I needed to learn that. And someday, it's probably going to come in handy. That's the way I look at it. Someday, maybe, the, you know, we'll get our money's worth. Mm-hmm. But um, I also think if I didn't have this knowledge, I probably couldn't speak the way I do now to be, even be on your show. You know, like maybe it helped me be a better speaker, a better writer. Who knows, right? Well, you know, also, you've been talking about possibly going back into law, but doing it in a, with a different twist. Maybe you want to elaborate a little on that? 
Well, you know, I'm I'm really interested in the the sovereignty law that you know a lot of people are declaring themselves sovereign beings, and that one of them is you know that Kate of Gaia, mm-hmm. you know Kate Renee, you know they're going in there saying. You know, you do not have jurisdiction over me. I am a human being. I have natural rights. I'm not a corporation. I don't care what you say. And I'm thinking, wow, I would really love to understand this completely and constitutional law as well, because that's something that I wouldn't mind getting into, because I feel like that would be very, very rewarding to me, because that definitely is more of a spiritual type of law, because it's law. But you still are being spiritual. The only thing is, is you still have to grant your allegiance to the crown. Mm-hmm. That's the only problem. The the bar is, you know, it's England. You're not, you know, you're pledging your allegiance to the crown when when you take the bar. So there's still that little hurdle. Damned if you do, and damned if you don't. Right. Yeah. You know, so that that's the only problem. So it's like, what do I do? What do I do with the law degree to make a difference at mm-hmm. this point? So. I'm open to suggestions. You know, people, you have our, you have my address. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know how to contact me if you think that there's something wonderful I can do in this world with this law degree to make a difference, make this a better world. Like, I'm, I'm open to people's suggestions in, mm-hmm. in what to do because, you know, people are very creative. Awesome. Let's uh, move on to number five. Try to eliminate as much fluoride from your daily routine. Not only does fluoride help to contribute to a more subservient population, it also calcifies your pineal gland, which is known as your third eye. Your pineal gland is a gateway to other dimensions, so if it's calcified, then you'll be limiting your utmost ability for creative thought and expression, as well as dimming your spiritual connection to creator and your higher self. The further you move away from spirituality, the easier it is for you to be controlled. I mean, I I agree with that. I try to stay away from it. I was kind of surprised that the levels of fluoride that were actually in like the um, crystal geyser or did those different brands of spring water, the mm-hmm. fluoride level was really high. But what I'm understanding is that it's a different type of fluoride. It's like a naturally occurring fluoride versus the added chemical fluoride. Is that right? That's what I understand too, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I, I couldn't tell you one way or the other if it is th- that or not, but uh, it is my understanding that there are that that is a natural kind of kind of fluoride. Yeah, because that's what I've read. Because when I've seen the levels, there's a lot of studies that have been done. Actually, these bottled waters. I mean, we're not talking about the purified. We're talking about the spring water in the bottles. Mm-hmm. Their fluoride level is much, much higher than the purified water. And I kind of thought, well, I thought I was doing the right thing in having, you know, the the spring water, but the levels are so, so high. So I think that it's fluoride in it, but I'm I'm not positive. Um, Maybe this is something that we can um, answer for another show. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, I, I also know that you can find fluoride. They're putting fluoride in everything. And as a matter of fact, uh, you, can, you can find products that are now advertising no fluoride, just like a no high fructose corn syrup. It's funny how they're advertising things that aren't in there anymore versus all the good things that are. But, uh, yeah, stuff like, uh, well, you know, bread even contains fluoride. Why would they put fluoride in bread? It's crazy. Well, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's the water that they use, that fluoridated water. Maybe they just have to label it more specifically now. At this that's point. true. That's true. If the dough that uh, they're making the bread with has fluoridated tap water in it, then, of course, you're going to be getting the residuals from it. <laughs> yeah, because that's kind of kooky. Yeah. What the heck? Like, let's add fluoride to the bread? That's mm-hmm. really weird. That'd be yeah. super trippy. Well, fluoride, what a lot of people don't know is that it's so toxic that if you were to dump a bucket full in a body of water, it would kill everything in that area. So how can it possibly be good for you? Oh, I mean, I know. And every study says it's, you know, it's, it's, it's awful for you. And one of my, um, you know, what was unusual, what, um, what I heard from one of my friends who was friends with somebody's uncle, we'll use the GLP term, somebody's friend's uncle, um, who worked for the water company, said that what is making people more sick in the water, the 
the municipal water systems is not the fluoride, but it's the the silicates that they use so that the water um, flows very freely through the pipes. And that's what's messing up a lot of people's digestive system because it's a, it's a, um, maybe it's like some kind of anti-foaming silicon in the water. Interesting. Yeah, I'd like to do a little bit more research on that. Um, but we, we need to move on because we only have a few minutes left on the show. Um, number six is uh, research the detriments of vaccination. Number seven is do not ingest any genetically modified foods or processed foods. And uh, the final one would be teach your children how to meditate. Did you ever teach your kids how to do that, or do they kind of learn on their own? You know what, they, um, they like to do that with me, and they, um, they just picked it up because it was very peaceful. And my daughter does it all the time, and she does videos, and they're on her blog of her meditating, and she does pictures, and she's really into it. And mm-hmm. my son... Um, he, he'll sit down with me, and um, sometimes he likes wants to hold hands with me and do it. And <laughs> he's a very spiritual child, and so it's it's kind of it's kind of fun. It's mm-hmm. kind of nice to feel his energy. He has a very a very loving, sweet little energy. But yeah, no, I think meditation is really great. I mean, even if I wish they could teach that in school, I really yeah. wish they could. Even if they took little breaks and called it deep breathing or something else, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, oh, I totally agree. That would be awesome. There was one time where uh, uh, my daughter, Brittany, was at my house, and she was having some kind of argument with one of her friends. And I was uh, downstairs, and she runs downstairs and goes outside and slams the door. So I thought, well, I'll give her a few minutes to cool off and figure out what's going on. So I go outside, and she's sitting there on the sidewalk meditating. Aww. Yeah, and so I just kind of like quietly shut the door and gave her a little extra time, but I thought that was so cool, and it's a memory that stays in my mind. Well, your my favorite memory still of your daughter is the um, the little animal in the closet. The woodchuck. <laughs> the woodchuck. I love that video. That It has to be one of my favorite videos. I mean, not just because you cuss in it, because you don't hear that very often, no. but it's just so funny. You know, you and your daughter are just the funniest uh-huh. two people in it. I love it. It's so precious. Uh-huh. Thank you, Sherry. Now, we're going to wrap things up right now because uh, we're almost out of time. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in to our show, as well as all of our chatters in the chat room, and to everyone listening to this on our archives. Next week, our guest will be Sherry Edwards, who developed a sound technology that can cure literally everything. As a matter of fact, I'll be releasing that article here tonight on in5d.com, so be sure to check that out. And this is an article about Sherry and her sound healing technology. So if any of you have any questions after reading that article and listening to the videos that are on there, feel free to call in next week, Sherry. That sounds super exciting. Do you know if she's able to do that by distance at all? She does it by sound. So you could do it over the phone. You could do it, yeah, definitely, long distance. Maybe she might be willing to do something over the air that might even be a little bit small. Perhaps I'd have to contact her about that, but I think that there's some kind of analyzation that needs to be done through the voice technology stuff. We can see. We can look into it. Okay, well, you make sure you have some homework then for next week. <laughs> you, know, so you have a task to do. Now, this is along with the next person that I meet that you remember that you need to check out their moon sign as well. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we know now you just have to go beyond the sun sign. We learned that from last week from Jim. <laughs> Always learning here on 5D Radio. We are. We're just learning and helping and moving right along. Well, well thank hope... you so much. It's yeah. been a wonderful show with you. I can't believe it's been three hours already. I know. I know, and it's time to say goodbye, and I'd like to say thank you once again. And on behalf of my co-host, Sherry, this is Greg from In5D.com. Namaste, everyone. Bye.